the Thinking Tackle podcast. I'm late, so I've been and uh, I sort yeah. of done a few years and then disappeared and then come back and done another couple of years and disappeared. So it varies. Yeah. You know, some places I'll just do a couple of years. I'll either catch a lot or I'll just catch a big one, one or the other normally. And then, I'll, but I'm not one for just catching every single one. Once I've had enough, it normally depends on who's getting on there. You know what sort of pressure it's going to get. Um, and all that sort of stuff. Once I see it going a certain way, I don't like it, that's it, I'm off. Yeah. Which is why all, all the lads always say, how come you're on Dinton? How how have you lasted for three years? I didn't realise it was like, I didn't realise it was quite that bad actually on there. It, it, it is for me, but other anglers say that a lot of the other waters, there's a lot of waters in Essex that are like it. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of waters like it, but I'm not, I've never been used to it. It's never been my thing at all. And I've never come up against anything like it. You know, the quality of anglers and that is just unbelievable. Oh, you should have fished, have you? Yeah. That would have been right <laughs> up your street, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I should have done. But I think I think with there, though, it's like, um, it's kind of like the last ticket that you really want. Yeah. You know, because after that, it's, cut fish is not really the same after yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Because the intensity, but, for, it but, seems to go a little bit. But that's that's where I've, I've never suffered like that. Wherever you know, it, I, I'm, I'm always inspired. I'm always determined, you know. And it always there's always another challenge. Yeah. You know, and I know as as magnificent as Dinton is fish wise, you know, I know that there'll be another challenge. It might be a lake with only two fish. You know, I've got I've had a picture on my phone this week from another place that's all hush hush, and I saw it and I thought, oh my god. As soon as I see these pictures, I look and I think, no, nah, no. Nah. Yeah, you know, I'll, 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 I can't drop this. I've got to, I've got to stay here. But once it's in your mind, you start leaning towards it. Yeah, you yeah. Know, quite, quite often you'll end up, you know, you'll, I'll end up dropping a ticket and going there. <laughs> Madness. Anyway, Mickey Gray, we are live now. Welcome to the Lovely. podcast. Fancy seeing you here? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> did did yeah. you ever see yourself doing a podcast? Never. No, never. I did not think you would do never. this. Never. But the thing is, you know, you know. A f- odd free spool of Calder Braid. I'll do anything, Sorry, <laughs> That's what, the, that's what it is, wasn't know. it? Yeah, yeah you've uh, already got the order in. <laughs> yeah. We've opened the door to everybody now, haven't we? Oh, I know, free, yes. Free yeah. Braid as well. Wow, you imagine that? I only, used the, I only use the most expensive stuff. You yeah. know. It's the best stuff, don't you? <laughs> it's good, I've got, I've got to say. Yeah. yeah it's good. But well, I know, well, We're not plugging anything on this podcast. No, not at all. No, not at all. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I use all sorts of stuff. So, yeah. You know, but, um, but you are quite... Um, because your name, when we were doing the show, and we were like, obviously, we've pu- pull a few names together. Yep. And to be honest, right, your name was like right up at the start, and it's like, he won't want to do this mm-hmm. podcast. Um, I mean, I don't, I didn't, we did used to fish on the same syndicate lake as each other. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And we did meet once. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I just didn't think you, you would want to do it. I'm, I'm, well, we're honoured to have you on here. It, again, it's the old story. You never know till you ask, do you? <laughs> And, and I probably wouldn't have done it if it was, you know, 15 years ago. I probably wouldn't have done it. You get older, you're not, you're not as bothered. Yeah. You know, plus you've got something to plug as well. So that, that, that always helps if you, you know, book or whatever. That's what you do. But you, you said you've never really been, um, you write a book for the, for the yeah, pleasure for, of writing for the book. Ex- exactly that, yeah. Yeah, Cert- certainly the first one as well. You just, you know, you, you just went head into it. I don't even really know how it all came about, but it, it, it did. Yeah. It did. But um, I know when Damon sent me a message about doing this, like, um, I said your super sexy voice so <laughs> was was the main reason. It is the most soothing voice on radio, podcast, whatever you want to call really? it. Really? Yeah. I am. I'm on no, Thank you very much. Very, very if, soothing. If that's what yeah. gets you on the show. Don't you worry. Don't you worry. Right, Mick. Start of the show. We always ask. Um, give yep. for a, for a gift. We sound a little bit cheeky, I know, but that's oh, what we do. Building up all. a nice collection now, though, aren't we? Well, I'm a little bit dubious about what well, we're going to find. Well, I'm going to. I'm just going to do the the boring old one first, which is. A copy of the book, which I'll just sling over there for Brilliant, you, Mick. so anyone can read that. Thank you very much. But right. forget about that. You put that down. Don't worry about that. Huh? This is the one. <laughs> right, you read the first book, didn't you? I read the first book. Okay. So if I was to put that on the table, and that on the table. Oh yeah. Oh dear. Okay. Mm. Right. So if you ask any questions I don't want to answer, you know what's going to happen. Yeah. Don't right. You? Okay. <laughs> we'll leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> and I bet, so at the moment, so for the people that are listening to this, we've got a can of Stella and we've got a very heavy bank stick on the table. Indeed. And um, and I might chase you all around the room with it. Yes. Yes. As yes. I did several people many years ago. <laughs> Anyone who was punishing us, they got chased around the well, chased around the lake. <laughs> it worked as well, didn't it? Yeah. We even had Richie McDonald once or try to but he um he threatened to kill us if we did <laughs> was that was that the story with the with the shotgun no no that was another one that was a few years later 
That wow, that was later. that was a crazy story. That yeah, was, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He I mean, was um, <laughs> it, again we jumped straight into Yately, but um, yeah, it was uh, it was like the Wild West at times. Yeah, it really, really was. And uh, Richie was a big part of it. He was, you know, he was brilliant. You know, he was he was a larger than life character. You know, one of the first people that you ever saw doing time. I think he used to work for th- fish three days a week and work three days. What did he do for a job then? Uh, I think he's done various things, labouring and what have you. But he also was working in Hounslow Angling for a few years mm. as well. So that's right. That's yeah, right. But um, he, he was he was certainly a lively guy. But he was he was good with all us, you know, very good. Apart from that one day. <laughs> <laughs> Just think, yeah, don't catch him on a bad day. He was the first carp angler that ever really sort of yeah. had any significance to me yeah you know seeing that seeing that picture of basil yeah what was that 84 wasn't it 84 85 somewhere around there yep i mean yeah we've mentioned it before on the podcast yeah. but and yeah the picture of the north lake behind him all flat and still behind him yeah. and um, it, it, it was it was the one that inspired a lot of our generation without a doubt i mean i was already on, i was already on the other side of the road fishing at the time at yately mm. yeah, um so but it was quite a mysterious thing over there you know that a few of the few of them lads would come over to to the side we were fishing and um every now and again we'd wander around there and then we ended up drifting over there in the future years and fishing for them and uh, trying to catch them ourselves which was um great great period but it, it, i mean was it a bit like high school not really no you didn't it, you didn't have that feeling of other anglers were superior to you in any shape or form. There wasn't that many anglers carp fishing. You know, so, you know, I remember going to some of the early carp societies, there's 200 people there, that's it. And everyone was drinking, it was very much a, a drunken thing sort of thing. You know, it was totally different. And you, most of the faces you'd knew, there was a few guys from up north, you know, that would come down. Tim Paisley and that were obviously heavily involved, but it was, it was tiny. Mm. And then they moved to Luton and Dunstable. But when we were having it at Hatfield, I think it was Hatfield, um, it, it was a different world. Mm. It was just like a social club, really, mm. you know, once a year. Yeah. They'd have a speaker, they'd have an auction, but it was it was minuscule compared to what carp vision is now. So you didn't really, you know, I mean, obviously Hutchie was always my favourite because it was one of the early bits of literature that I got to read. Um and then you had Kevin Maddox, which was a much more, um, what's the word? Scorch. Yeah, they were like yin and yang, weren't they? Those yeah, two? Definitely, yeah. I'm definitely of the Hutchie yeah. side. I definitely prefer yeah, me that too. side. But then there was, you know, I had lots of mates who who, who were very secret squirrel and very um, very much the um, the Kevin Maddox cart fever way. So do you think that shaped you as an angler a little bit? Or is it you, you just, because you've never sort of tried to, you know, you've written a few books now, but you've always had this reputation for just keeping yourself to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, certainly, certainly for most of the younger years. But you know, obviously, the second you put pen to paper, it changes a little bit. I mean, Jason Haywood had a great conversation with me when I'd done the first book, and he said, "Oh, are you going to do any slide shows? Are you going to go to the show? Are you going to do this?" And I went, "No." He went, "What?" And then Jay's quite a good businessman in his head as well. He, he's 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 you know astute, and he just said to me, "You are having a laugh, Mick." He said, "How much did it cost you to do it?" So I told him. And it was enough that you wouldn't have had a holiday for probably 20 years. You know, it was a lot of thousands of pounds. And um, he said, you got, you're mad. He, he used another word to describe me. And he said, you've got to go out there and sell it. And it was probably one of the best bits of advice I've had. You know, so I did. And obviously the second one, I've done the same. But again, I, I just think I've got a little bit older. I really don't care now, mm. you know. As long as I'm not blowing any big secrets or anything like that, I'm quite, I'm quite, I'm quite happy. Normally, a lot of the fish have died by the time I get to write about them. You know, they were old fish to start with, so you're not giving too many games away. You never, you don't use the names of the lakes very that, often. No, either, I've, t- I've tried to do that. One, one, ones that I know are a little bit sensitive. I've, I've used other, other, other things. I mean, the people that know will know the lakes mm. anyway. But a lot of other people haven't got a clue. Mm. You know, even now, people say, "Well, where was that lake?" Or, well, I think I asked you one of them as well. And yep. as soon as you said the name of the lake, I thought, "Yeah, crikey, yeah, yeah." yeah. That's right. So you know, it's um, that was just a courtesy thing, really. Yeah. You know, but a lot of the places, it's um, by the time I write about them, they've they've. They've, they're going backwards by that stage, hmm. you know, only to be reborn later, like a lot of places. You know, Do you yeah. think the whole slideshow thing as well? Because we were saying as well that they're, 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 they're not as we went to. I went to a slideshow with Damo just before Christmas and Tim Paisley and uh, sorry, who else was it? Who did I say? Terry Dempsey yeah. was uh, was doing a talk. 
And the the attendance was really disappointing yeah. for yeah. those type of people. Again, that little that little group that started off as two, three hundred anglers in the country, you know, and was even smaller long before I ever picked up a carp rod, probably, which was around nineteen eighty. You know, it, it, that has, has swollen to massive, and now it's shrinking again. Mm. You know, but what it is, you've got a lot of anglers around it that they're not worried about the history, they're not worried about where they're from, the, the nationality of the fish, anything like that, what the kudos is, or, or anything like that. They're not interested. They go fishing to catch a carp. And I believe, my hand on art, I only think we've got three, 4,000 anglers in this country that have got that same attitude and that all the rest are exploring their way and going along now and doing it and living their dream, but their dreams are different to ours because it's a different generation. You know, and I, I remember, uh, m you know, I remember one of the first foreign ones I heard about, about 1986, 87, I remember Richie McDonald going nuts on the bank, absolutely nuts. You know, and that fish grew on and became a well-known fish and people have said it's this and that and the other, but it's done now, that was then, you know, and whilst I can pick and choose what I fish for, you know, and, that, and so can other people. And you you end up having to accept that, whereas 20 years ago, I'd have been ferocious. Mm. You know, I'd, I'd have said, you know, I'd have really spelt it out and said said words I shouldn't say to people, mm. you know, and, and that, that was how serious, you know, it was to us. But now it's opened up and people just go fishing to catch and they don't care. But it is a shame for people like us to see. Yeah, because you're a pretty passionate guy, aren't you? You, you said a few times. Yeah. I mean, you've actually... Uh, you've not fished some pretty good fisheries yeah. because of that. I mean, yeah. um, it's a shame though, isn't it? Because, it, I mean, it's a little bit like the social media thing, isn't yeah. it? And where people are worried about their kids growing up because yeah. it's kind of takes takes the emotion away from things a yeah. little bit as well. And it's, yeah. it's, it's, not, it's, it's not just a fishing thing. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's social, a, it's a social thing now, it's a social thing now, thing now it's, isn't it's, it? It's massive. Yeah. You know, but again, you know, there's all the negative around it. And a lot of it, is, I, I do feel it is a quite negative, but... At the same stage, that's the way of the world, and mm. you either move with it and carry on enjoying it. I mean, I often hear anglers say, oh, it's not like the old days, it's not like the old days, and it isn't. But it's still good times, you know, and, and you know. So your attitudes have changed a little bit over the definitely, years. Definitely, yeah. definitely softened, yeah. Or sold out, as some of my <laughs> friends would say. But, you know, again, I can take that on the chin if that's what someone thinks, that's what they think. I just see it as just... You know, rambling on a few old stories. I like the old stories, but I also, there's plenty of new stories. You know, we're still out there now fishing, meeting lots of young anglers, you know, and, and, and in, in the main, most of the anglers I meet now are far better than we were, we ever were at that age. Yeah, you know, In fact, they're far better than I am at my age now. <laughs> yeah, but you, we've got some guys here, you know, there's yeah. some young young yeah. kids here you know, and yeah. I mean, they're, they're unbelievable for their yeah. age. How did you become that, that good so quickly? That's it. I think, I think, I think the social side of it has changed a lot. You know, the drinking was major, major in the 80s. But as I always said, from the moment I used to fish the, a place called the Diana Pond and we fished there for years and then we moved on to Yate, it, it was just, we were seeing women, girls, because we were only young lads. We were dressing up, wearing all these clothes. We were drinking and we were going to see Chelsea and other teams. <laughs> that, what more do you want when you're an 18 year old? You know, and that's what it was so like. Maybe probably Arsenal. Yeah, it, not well, to see Chelsea. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I can't say much at the moment, because damn it, you beat us the other day, but I know you should give me the red cord here that as well on the yeah, old mic. Sure <laughs> done that on purpose, yeah. mate. But, but no, no it, it's, it's true, was it? We, we, you, we read, in, you know, I mean, the famous five and all that stuff, you know, yeah. they were, every, everyone would actually take their best clothes fishing with yes, them. Yes, I've, uh, I've seen Stevie and, um, and certainly uh, Rob Malin as well, when they were young, young men, the same as we were. I think we might have been two or three years younger than them. But I remember going to Broadlands once, of all places. <laughs> it was on a bank holiday Monday because you didn't have close season fishing in most places and you had to have trout in there. So they bunged down for the trout and then everyone went there for a couple of bank holidays. And I remember seeing them all getting their you know, tuxedos out and off they went in the car. You know, and, and that set a precedent for us as well. That's what we did. You know, quite often, wherever the nearest pub was to the lake, we used to fish, um, well, my mates used to fish down at Payne's Hill, down at um, Cobham. Um, and funny enough, Albert Romp used to fish there, and I lived next door to him for many years. So <laughs> I used to see him going with all the old tea mugs and what have you, and all the old kettles and all the old gear. And, um, yeah, we found a place opposite, and it had all the... Um, what they called all the au pairs from Isha. Oh, great. Oh, we had a whale of a time. You yes. live next door to Albert Romp, of all the people. Yes. 
Yes. For anyone that doesn't know Albert Romp. Yes. Yeah. Probably. Probably one of them. He's a bit of a character. Probably one of the leaders of the drinking brigade. Actually, (laughs) probably taught us everything we know. So were you were you cart fishing and everything when you were living next door to him? Not first of all. No, I was I was float fishing, um, match fishing, um, just pleasure fishing really. But but still really keen. But I was at school, and um, he had a couple of kids, and he lived with Phyllis at the time. He's not married to her now. And um, yeah, quite often he would come home inebriated and she would threaten to kill him out the window and not let him in. And Albert would, as I've seen Albert many times over the years, a lot like that. anyway, they moved away and I lost touch. And I went to a, a, um, one of the carp conferences and one of my mates, Big Cole, he, he walked up to him and he said, my mate wants to see, he wants to speak to you. He said, do you recognise that bloke? It really embarrassed me, really yeah. embarrassed me. And typical Albert, he's turned around, just looked at me like that, and he's gone, you're the snotty-nosed little kid next door with the nappy on I used to give the Angling Times an angler's mail to. <laughs> legend. Yeah. You know, for me personally, yeah. legend. You know, it, it was it was brilliant. I mean, I, I think he's been ill. He was ill a couple mm. of years ago. I don't know how he's doing nowadays, but... Uh, yeah, but th- th- they were the sort of stories, and they were the sort of people. It was a lively, it was a lively, a lively not sport, a lively hobby, you know. Whereas now you don't seem to have them characters in, like you mentioned Frank Warwick, the, the, coming in the other day. I mean, Frank's, you know, again, I've only met him a couple of times. He knew a good mate of mine, um, Big John, and um, I did have the pleasure of talking to him a couple of times. But he's you just do he's renowned meet, for his stories. You just don't meet people like that, no, do you? No, uh, th- there you must be there must be some out there, but I, I, either either they're not writing or they're not coming out the woodwork. But you know, you, you know from doing this show. I mean, if you, if you're really looking for stories, and uh, yeah. I think um, Tom Stokes actually is yeah. is is yeah. is the is, yeah. is the next one in he's, that respect. He's the, he's the buzzword at the moment, is Tom. He, he is, you know, and, and, yeah. and around the area where you know where I am, quite a lot. So, but he's, um, he's got. Maybe not the drinking stuff and all that, but he's yeah. got uh, he's got yeah. a bit of charisma about yeah. him, and he can tell yeah. he can tell a story, you yeah. know. And yeah. uh, but it, and I think when you hear him, yeah. someone like that, you think, well, we need to get him on the podcast yeah. because we haven't got. Yeah, I can see. I can tell. By, I can tell like by his eyes. I've only seen a couple of little clips yeah. on whatever, like publicising topography or whatever. But I've seen it, and I've looked like that, and I can see by his eyes, and his hands are going like that. And that, oh, that, I, I can see talking to him. That's a good sign. Talk to someone on a, a personal level not so comfortable as soon as that fishing stuff starts yeah. it's like someone's just turned yeah. a battery on it's yeah. like poof, you know yeah. long may it continue yeah that's right but and that's that's what i mean it's yeah. seeing seeing people like yeah. that is yeah. um and and in fairness to you know a lot of the behavior that we did back then you know <laughs> if you did that now you'd be banned from every water in the country you wouldn't be allowed you wouldn't be allowed to behave like yeah. that. you know the, and the noise factor singing songs at night parties i mean i used to sit next to one lake and my mate, he, he was known, as, he only, his name's Fuxi, and he only ever fished the car park swim. On whatever lake he fished, it was, it was the car park swim. <laughs> Didn't like a walk. No. So he'd park his car in the car park and fish out the back of his car. Well, literally, every time we'd go off, it was when we were in the Colne Valley fishing pit four, we'd all disappear and we'd do whatever. And um, we'd go for a curry, we'd go back to the nightclub afterwards, or we'd go back, to, we used to go to the strippers. I know that's not PC nowadays, and uh, my daughter would, was probably going to give me a smack. But, um, you know, we used to do all that, come back to the lake, and he would just literally sl- shut the door, four of us in the car, and it, Ace of Spades would go on by Motorhead. And it, it, everyone was just sat there going, Ace of Spades, Ace of Spades, Ace of Spades, as loud as you like for about an hour. Yeah. Same record. So, you know, that, that's that's the kind of characters that, that we've met across the years. And most of them I'm still friends with. Still got them on my phone. I only text folks the other day about something, you know. So, and, and that's another thing that's been brilliant for it is, is meeting people on different waters over the years. And you said you've been able to maintain relationships with people Absolutely, as well. yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, when, you know, when I was on Ashmead, some of them Somerset boys, they were some of the hardest nuts to crack because, mm. you know, flash Londoners or anyone with a little bit of like an ego or whatever, they, they, they don't take to you at all. But after a little while, you just weren't. Once they know you're all right, yeah. You know, and the next thing you know, you're you're out there, you're drinking with them, eating with them, and, and you were like that on our, that syndicate lake that we were fishing as well. I, I that's right, yes. I get that impression. Yeah, reading, that, reading the book as well. Well, it's, you know, you, you you look at. I mean, they won't thank me for many, but the, the Gardner brothers were mm. lovely guys. There, there was a lot of nice lads on it, and, and it was a very quiet place, you know. And, and I felt that at the time, and that was never going to be in the book because it was non-publicity. And I'd, I'd written, it was in the story, I'd written it all and that, but hadn't published it. 
and I knew I had to make the phone call to Tom to ask him whether get his permission to either use it or not. If you'd have asked me to bet on it, I'd have bet a week's cool. wages Blimey. that he was going to say no. Mm. And I rang him, and he said, yeah, don't name it. He said, but yes, you can do it. And I nearly fell over. Mm. I couldn't believe it. And he, he said it was because the otters had been up there and caused a bit of damage, so it, he was struggling to fill the syndicate that year. Apparently, it's all full and, and mm. good again now. Um, so, yeah, so it, it worked out. But again, I didn't name it. But some of, but some of the people were quite difficult to crack on there, weren't they? Absolutely, was, But yeah. you can understand yeah, it as well. You know, if people are putting a lot of time yeah. in there. Yeah. Actually, have we got some pictures, Tobe, of some of yeah. your... Um, some of your friends' captures, actually. We've yeah, got... Um, yeah. um, have you got a few pictures on there? Um, again, yeah. again, that's one of the big things in fishing. Is if it's all about your own captures... But that's a pretty special fish, Mick, as well, isn't it? It was considered... If it's all about your own captures, you're going to have a hard time on it. Yes. If yeah. you, you have to appreciate the people around you and your friends. And even if it grates you for whatever reason, don't show it. Yeah. Just say, well done. I and know. I mean, that's Tell's probably one of my best mates nowadays. He is my best mate. Um, Terry Pepperbridge. Yeah, um, yeah. Petrol Breath, he's known I as. I know, I know. <laughs> Has yeah. he really got bad breath? He's got a, no, he's got a savage tongue. If you had him on here, <laughs> you know, you, you, you'd have to. You'd the have first to time I saw him was on the um, Yately Yahoo crew video, right. which I got yeah. in 1992 for Christmas. Yeah. He's, he's, uh, yeah. He looks quite menacing at times, but uh, he's got a heart of gold and he's been blinking good to me. Is that the Royal 40? That's the Royal 40, yep. And he went on there, fished days only, didn't night fish it. Um, and he, he baited and baited and baited and baited. And he was so confident that that fish was going to. Um, be a big weight because of the bait you put in and it was it was like 48 pound at the time is that like the highest that's got to be one of the top weights it, it may one, well it? have been it was very close to yeah. it yeah it, it died a couple of years later i think but mm. um yeah and that that was that was such a highlight that was that was a, a, a brilliant a brilliant thing and obviously you met yeah. uh, you met terry down on yately I'm, with the <laughs> well that 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 alone that's i mean one up there for you as well. when you go back to that's more recent i'll tell you about that, that one in a minute yeah okay but um when you go back to the yately one I wish I had a picture of it, actually. Um, he, he caught Heather the Lever, and they'd just done this little bank that went between the North Lake and the river and the car park and the river. They'd just had to backfill it to make sure the river didn't flood in or the lakes flood out, whatever. So they, um, it was just a pile of rubble. Anyway, he caught Heather the Lever over there. This was about 1986, I suppose, 87, something like that, maybe. And it was 39 pound, and... Um, he, in his wisdom, and this is where he's a top, top character, he just said, I'm not laying that queen of the lake on this bank. <laughs> he said, look at it, for hundreds of yards either side, 100 yards each side, it's like that. So anyway, there was this bloke down there, I think he said his name was Slim, and he said, don't worry. He said, what I do, the, the nearest grass is in the car park. He said, we're literally, get the, car in the, uh, the, the fish in the back of the car, and I'll drive you around to your swim in my BMW. <laughs> the the back of he car. drove, <laughs> wheel spinning up to there, picked it up, till sat in the back, they passed it to him, it was in a sack and holding it on his lap, <laughs> the back of a BMW all the way round to the car park, put it down on the grass, done the pictures, put it back. Well, there was these two blokes fishing there who were seeing all this, must have been thinking, oh my God, are they nicking the fish? Because mm. it was rife in them days. Mm. And... Um, the bad thing is, Tell didn't go back to his bivvy. They all went down the pub to celebrate afterwards. <laughs> so these blokes must have thought they that thought fish had long and gone. Yeah, but, um, you know, imagine you did that now. You'd, you'd, you'd be crucified. But there was, no, there, there was no real rules then. You know, very few rules. You know, And that was leisure sport who had probably a few more than most. But most lakes you went to, there were no rules. You know, it's a different world. To imagine a carp like that in the back of somebody's car. I mean, Thirty-nine pound of history Tom, carp. Toby, for you, I mean, Heather was quite a well-known carp, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> just chucked it in the boot, and just gone. in the boot of someone's car. I know, I know. <laughs> Again, it was, you know, I don't condone that, by the way. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> not unless absolutely necessary. Um, this was on Dinton, and mm. again. I forget what it was when it was when I first started on there. We uh, done a little trip together and whatever. You, and Simon Bartlam, who runs Dinton as well, he's he's got some beautiful fish in them lakes. He um, literally tail caught this that night. It was thirty two pound. It's it's a dead fish now. It's gone. Um, that's because we used a Fiat five hundred instead of the BMW. <laughs> the was it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and and literally it was. I see it and he. We were doing the pictures. I was doing the pictures. And I was snipping away. And he went to turn it. I said, don't turn it around. He said, why not? I said, listen, mate. 
that is the mantelpiece carp. That's what I called it, the mantelpiece yeah. carp. Any carp I want to catch, I call the mantelpiece carp. Because like, in the old days, you put your pictures on the mantelpiece. You don't do that now, but you would have done. So we call them mantelpiece carp. That was one. I said, the other side's nice, but you keep, you keep it. And I took so many pictures. That and it just came out superb. And that, that, that fish was just wonderful. Wonderful. There's no mistake in those carp. No, they're, they're a breed to himself. And they're, the colour really of are. them as well. Yeah. They've got that. And obviously, yeah. they're, they're yeah, beautiful fish. Yeah. But again, that, that, their moments with us three, me, mm. Tell, and Cy there, you know, it, it was great fun. And, that, and, that, and that, is, that is what it's still about, even today. You know, it's a little bit harder this, these days because, you know, you do have to behave yourself a little bit more. But it's um, still plenty of, it's plenty of place to, uh, places to have a bit of fun. No. And uh, Tell is just a joke a minute as well. There's literally thousands of jokes. No, about like I say, I remember him, and he's he's been around for he's been yeah. around for years, hasn't he? Yeah. Mick, is it fair to say there's like three passions in your life? <laughs> Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I was that to say, I would say your family, because reading yep. your book, you know, it's like um, it's like evident how you know how close your family are. Yeah. You, 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 you do an awful lot together. You said you still yep. go away on holidays together and yep. stuff now. Yeah, they're 20 and 21, so we go to Cornwall every year. Love it, and they, they still come. And now they're bringing their partners each year. So, yeah, they've, 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 they've been brilliant. But also, like, like we tell, he's, his kids as well and my kids, we've all grown up. Not grown up together, but as they've all grown up, Tell talks to me about his teenage problems with his kids and the same with me. So, you know, it's been it's been... It's been wonderful to see them growing up, really, mm. you know, but, um, yeah, and the fact they still come on holiday is fantastic. They're very supportive. Yeah. They're very, very supportive. You said you like going to the same place each year as well, We've don't you? been, I think it's 16 years now, and the, the rule is we don't name the place anymore because we don't want other people to go. It's that beautiful. It's that beautiful, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's and it, it's that quiet, you know, which is what we like. If you like noise and loads and loads of things going on, then don't go down there. But that's nice, isn't it? That your kids still want to do that with you. Yeah. What do you think the secret to that is? I, I don't know. I just think because it's a wonderful place. I think it's another. It's a bit like. Surf. But the fact that your pair, your your kids still want to go on holiday with. Uh, I I think. F oh, for that. I yeah. Was, yeah. I don't know. I like I, I like to think I get down and dirty with them sometimes, yeah. as far as going out for a drink goes. And yeah. Every, <clears throat> this is an embarrassing one, and not a nice one. I don't, again, I don't condone it, but <laughs> I, we all went out, uh, not last year, the year before, I think it was. We did it again this year, but we went out the year before. <laughs> and it was the first time they'd sort of grown up, and I was telling them to go out, but I want them back by 12 o'clock. Okay, so I'd wake up, oh, I'd sit there like, I couldn't sleep. You know, and eventually they'd come in at 12, i say, look, Dad, it's such a good party, or it's so good in the bar tonight, we want to stay down there. And my wife kept saying to me, you've got to let them go, Mick. You know, that they are now 16s and 15s and 17s. So they're getting to that age, you've got to let them go. And we knew they were safe because we know the owners and all that. So we started letting them off the lead a little bit. And I started sleeping wonderfully. And they, start, they started coming in, coming in. I had to look after them a few times, you know, and whatever. And a few of their friends. <laughs> and anyway, the next year I decided to go with them and, um, and my wife. My wife went back home. We started at four o'clock in the afternoon. It got to about seven, eight o'clock. Big group of us. My wife went back to the caravan. She'd had enough light. And she said, you're going to be late, aren't you? I said, yeah. Said, this is where I teach them. And literally two o'clock in the morning, we got back. And it was a, a mad scene. We had my boy being ill in the toilet we had me being ill in the toilet sink and we had my daughter being ill in the kitchen sink fine family i called it shameless <laughs> and some people said there is a slight resemblance just different hair color. i wasn't going to say anything mate yeah that's it yeah yeah <laughs> and is that a tradition now is that something we that go out yeah and, and uh, not not to not to all, to all three throwing extent. up but right, uh, yeah right. to go out yes and it is and it's it's and again that's that goes on and plus you, you've been there through their hard times as well yeah and yeah. you know and I, ho I like to think you know there's times when I could have just thrown my toys out of pram with them but I didn't mm. you know I literally tried to understand it from their point of view and how young they were and, and went with it but yeah everything they feel you feel mm. and and, that, and that's 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 yeah yeah very very strong bond there I like the story in the book you know the the the, 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 the teachers evenings and yes. um yeah. and they and they used to come fishing with you as well they did they did but they never fished really they just um she bought a bar you got a picture there Tobe actually the kids yeah I saw this in the book as yeah. well they yeah. like to sort of uh yeah. 
have a little bit of picture yeah, when they're they do. Up. But that, that's a, that's a, a mad story. That picture. I think it's the one of them on the two t- on the trees. That could have been serious. It could have been serious. Mm. Literally, I was fishing, and that's the one. And that tree there, um, it was standing upright when I left, and. I, I was set up in a load of nettles and I thought I can't fish there tonight because the two kids are coming down and they lay all their soldiers and Barbie dolls out and I put my Barbie dolls out there as well and um, literally they um, they came the next day I went to pick them up but I'd moved my gear to another swim well anyway they, they ran ahead by I don't know about five minutes ahead of me and I could hear them going dad 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 and I got there and that was literally where my bivvy was Bloody hell. So, wow. and it's one of, like Cracked Willow, they call them um, widow makers, don't mm. they? Mm. Where they just go. There's mm. no wind, no nothing. They just dry out and then they just crack. Mm. And that, that's obviously what had happened. So, yeah, that was quite a quite a mad moment. And one of their moments, I sat there in the evening and, like, they were fast asleep and I'm looking at them and, you, you know, you're well up. You know, it's it's... It's an amazing thing, kids, without a doubt. No, it is. Now, touch wood, you hear that a lot with these trees as well. And touch wood, like I say, a lot of the time, the anglers have either just moved or they've just avoided them. But, yeah, yeah, that is... Yeah, if that had come down, that would have done. You know, but you think you're spending a lot of time with your kids, even yeah. though you know you're quite a, you're a hardcore carp yeah. angler. But you were saying yeah. that you were you're a postman and you um yeah. you could you you were only like fishing one night a week well, as well. Yeah, all, all my life, or well, most of my life, my job was six days a week. So I'd fish on a Saturday night, and that was about it. But I'd do a little bit of holiday certain times of the year. I'd have a month off, but even then, I'd only do three, maybe four nights in them weeks off because something would always happen at home when the kids were younger. About 10 years ago, the post office moved over to work in a five-day week, a rotated day off during the day. So I started to get two nights a week just as the kids were getting a bit older, so that got a bit better. And then about seven years ago, um, they offered to buy me some of my contract out, and I took it, and we'd just finished paying off the mortgage and whatever, and I thought, I'm going to do this. So I did, and basically, so probably the last five, six, maybe even seven years, I've been able to fish three nights a week on a Tuesday to a Friday. But that coincided with the kids getting to that 16, 17, where they just come, at that stage, they would come in and hold their hand out for money and go. Now they earn their own money, you know, so it's a, it's, it's a different world. And my wife works during the week, um, trying to get her to, to cut a day out so that we can uh, do other stuff, but she's a workaholic. Without is this is this the perfect life for you now then with what you've got that it balance? Is. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but you you know you you do miss that that you know the kids when they're younger. You know, my daughter will go away now and she stays with her boyfriend quite a lot up in Watford. So the weekend she's not there and she's out gallivanting. They go up London and what have you. So yeah, but my boy's in and out all the time still. You know, with yeah. his, he's got a lovely girlfriend now and they they all seem happy. So yeah, it's just all settled. And so it, it, to, to to get out and do a bit of time. It also makes you realise how, you know, all you know, all these people, all them years ago, I used to, I mean, Jacko, my mate, he would have a summer off every now and again and whatever. He was a builder or labourer and doing other stuff. And sometimes I'd pack up five, you know, four o'clock in the morning even with all my gear on my back, getting back to the car so I could go to work to start at five o'clock. And one time I walked by and I think it was, I think it was Terry the Tench. Um, I think it was Jacko, my mate Tetley. And I remember them all, they were, you know, they were inebriated. And they were literally laughing at me as I literally walked by, like in a friendly way, but like laughing at me. Yeah, yeah off to work you go, you know. And oh, but now the, 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 it's reversed for me. You know, I'm you know I've semi-retired you now. You feel like you've earned your kind of. Oh, I do. Bit of extra I've worked there now. 36 years. So, yeah. but there's, I mean, again, some of them work colleagues that I've worked with, they un- they know how mad I was on fishing, and a great great story. 1992 when I caught Basil, and um, literally, I, I, I'd had a week off work, and on the first day of it, responsibilities and all that, I remember taking my nans down to Brighton, no, Eastbourne, for a couple of days. They were going to stay there a week, and I was going to pick them up in a week's time. So the first two days of my holiday, I didn't fish. And then I dropped them off, come back, and I remember Tina saying, we just bought the house at the time, or, ju- or just about to buy it. She said, go on, go, go and have some fishing. So I went up the old North Lake, and it was all quiet and lovely, and I just went onto this famous basil bush yeah. and someone someone said to me, oh, someone was in there last week, someone was in there last week, and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, oh, because it was just starting to get busy then, Yately. End of my time. I'd done the nine years up there by then. And I just whopped this single up under the right. And a bloke called Martin King, who works in Yately Angling, was sat there with me. And that lead went in, under, down, crack. Like that. And I thought, I'm not going to put no bait on that. I put it up. We had some Guinness. <laughs> Cracked open a Guinness, sat back like that. 
He's sitting there with me. He said, oh, I've got to go now, Mickey. And he lived around the corner, so off he wandered. I sat there, all of a sudden. Diddly, 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 diddly. Drop back, the biggest drop. And we used to have our rods up here then. Mm. And the, the biggest drop back in the world. And I've literally went down, hit it. And it's like just a lump of concrete. It just, <laughs> I thought, is it snagged? And then all of a sudden it went, as, it, as they do. Oh, my God. And it, went to, it was going to these bushes. And it skirted around the edge of these bushes. And as soon as I got it around, I thought, oh, that's all right. That's it. I'm going to land this one. And it was it weeded me. So I forget who it was that came around. I think it was a bloke called Motormouth, little Richie. He came around and um, I, I, I swam out, basically freed it. And like a dog on a lead, towed it out a bit further, got back on the bank, played it again. It done it to me again, done it again. All this time, I had no idea what it was on the end. And for some reason, I sort of see it in the edge and I, th I thought it was the second biggest one in there, one they called a snake. And... Uh, yeah, Richie got in the water and he was just about to net it and I've pulled it over and it's gone in and he's just looked back at me like that with his eyes. And anyone who knows Motor Mouth knows. That's one too. Oh, yeah. No, nothing will ever equal that. That's one of the best pictures of Basil I've seen. We're nothing. looking at a picture of Basil yeah. now on the no, It's no, nothing, really dark there. You see nothing those? will ever equal it. For me personally, you know, in, 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 that I've caught. Um, That's the most iconic carp that's swum in this well, country. Well, you know, it's, it's there, there is others. There is others, and, and, and depending on where you're from in the country, but it, people it, got, it but was the start of that. It was yes. the start of that era, though, yeah. wasn't for it? For me, for me, you're right. But I know there's other people that feel oh, differently it's just and what have you. Yeah, yeah, but but for me personally, and Terry Peff, my mates, are saying it's it's always <laughs> been. It doesn't matter how big a carp, and I've caught some beautiful carp later on. Hopefully, we'll see. But that one, what it stood for at that time how big it had been for that length of time. And the fact, I think that year, there were 16 forties caught in the country and it was only four or five fish. So there was probably, I mean, even bearing a couple of secret ones that I might not have known about, there was probably only seven to 10 forties in the whole of the country at that time. So for me, it was mad. And, and, it, and we, you know, and in fairness, the lake had got busy I wouldn't have lasted the rest of the season on there. I, I, I was ready to jack really? it. Really? Yeah, because I'd, you'd just come down on a Tuesday night, there was 13 people on there and all that sort of stuff, and it's not my cup of tea. You know, the other lakes I'd fish, and they'd always been pretty, fairly quiet, but it was just starting to get it. You're starting to get a lot of publicity and that. And then, bang, you know, it happened. So it was like like a little pat on the back and someone sending me on my way. But it's um, Don't you find every cut that you caught after that you know around the 45 yep. pound mark you're yep. always going to compare it to you to you Basel. do you do and and if you it, it depends on what you're going to compare but the history of it as well and the fact that we really wanted it you know we all set out set out us you know and, and some many many good anglers and many other people have set out to do the same thing in in subsequent years it will always be for me the the, the number one capture that i've ever had and the thing that blew me away is when little richie looked back like that i looked at him and i went it's her isn't it he went, and it was just me, him, and one other person that did the pictures on my camera. The light was fading. I had Olympus OM10 at the time, so it was stone ground lens where you ha where you had to split level, so you had to line it up. There was none of this automatic focus in them days. All right, so the light was fading. <laughs> didn't I knew, know what you were going to get. Didn't know what we were going to get, but I said, I said, oh, there's no way I'm sacking it up for the night or anything like that, which you know, is common sense. You'd think, but unfortunately, some people do these things. So literally, got it out done the pictures it was a big risk and then when they come back i got four pictures that were just ah oh, you know and, and and it's captured a memory forever and one i can even now makes the you know goosebumps stand up on your back oh, of your yeah. neck so, and as so many other people have had that pleasure as well you know which you know nowadays we, it's nice to look for carp they haven't been caught too much and all that but that was the reverse you know we knew it had been caught it had a history but it was one of the history fish without a doubt yeah uh, when did you start fishing yately then I started about, I think it was 83, somewhere around there. So you were really young when you started fishing? Yeah, we went straight from Bushy Park, you know. Um, yeah, straight from Bushy Park, we went there. Um, there was people like Jason Hayward, Phil Thompson, you know. Uh, there was a nice story with Jason. Sorry to go back, yeah. but J didn't Jason catch the Black Mirror on, he on did. the same week yeah, that you yeah, caught Basil? That's right. And the, the, the mad thing was, at that moment, it was secret. Okay, he mm. hadn't let the cat out of the bag to many people, so I caught that, and I remember some of our, some some lads sort of saying, "Oh, well done, that's the biggest one between your little group, the Diana Syndicate, which was Phil Thompson, yes. Jason, and I knew it wasn't because I knew Jay had caught that one two two weeks, and yeah, and that again, that is an iconic fish, yes, you know, and for me, 
that capture of Jay's, in my humble opinion, is is the best capture in my lifetime. We got a picture of that. I like the yeah. story with Jay because it was a windy old day, wasn't it, when he caught that as well, wasn't oh, it? And I, he, he didn't even. Do... Yeah, all, I, as far as I, all I heard is that he just he just put out some put out a, a, a couple of grains of hemp on a rig and just lobbed it out there basically. Mm. But he'd been baiting it and doing what he always does. He he, he doesn't. Leave you got anything. a picture of that too, Black Mirror. He doesn't leave any for no, chance, Jay, and he, he still doesn't no, today. But chuck it up afterwards. Mate. Okay. But but to to catch that one, you know, uh, uh, that he'd been after for a few years, that as far as we're aware, had never been caught, you know, and had grown to that size. We see it a few years earlier. Um, I was with Jason, no, not Jason, Jacko, and. John Butley, and we're pretty sure we saw that one in the water, and it was probably 30, 35, up to 30 at the time. And then, but we never fished for it. I was up Yately, you know, Yately was, was it. But Jay, he went for it, and uh, yeah, and the, the rest is history, really. Well, yeah. But it had become one of the most, you know, again, one of the most meritous fish out there. You know, it, you know all fish are meritous, but that was, you know. That, that, that was one of them, that was wasn't something, it? Something else, yeah. Yeah. Something no, else. it's nice that you caught those two fish on the, you know, around the same around the same period. time, yeah. But but you said so like eighty three. So what what did you know about the eight lead? Where did you what what lake did you start fishing on? Well, funny enough, we were um, <clears throat> we were over Tri Lakes. Me and my mate Gareth cruising carp fishing, and uh, we looked across a fence and we see what was called the beach swim on the match lake, and we just saw all these backs cruising and whatever. We jumped over, had a look, and uh, eventually got tickets. It was seventeen pound at the time. Seventeen pound or nineteen pound, and off, and that's for the whole complex. Yeah, and off we went, and it just started from there, really. So we didn't even go over there with knowing that Yateley was this, that, and the other. But around that stage and that time, <clears throat> the locals on there and Terry Glavioski, um, who was a brilliant character, dead now, um, he was moving fish about, and uh, you know, my mate actually caught one a twenty-five pounder. And, and I've got a picture of him with it out at the match lake and um, it's got a tail on it and when t um, Terry Glubioski moved it in a rucksack the, the tail, a bit of the tail came off apparently I mean again you don't do that sort of thing but it was done in them days that was the way it was and um, he tipped it in the lake and that became known as Arthur Arthur tail Arthur, Arthur out, out the car park lake so yeah so it's you know they were, they were creating history themselves then by were. moving them about mm. but at that stage there was a 40 pounder caught out of of, um, out of Tri Lakes to a guy called Graham Mountain who eventually fished on Yateley and I think he caught Basil and I think he caught Hever as well years and years later but that was a really nice fish it was used on a Richworth one of the, one of the early, very early Richworth adverts so but um, a lot of people didn't believe that, that there was didn't a, Pete Springate catch a, a 40 pound fish out of Yateley as well early he early did 80s. no that was Kenny Hodder Ken, Kenny Kenny caught Kenny Hodder it. did yeah yes. that's that scaly one yeah, yeah yeah so even before we went there was history but we we didn't know it because mm. you didn't you hadn't seen you hadn't seen Pete Springate and Kenny Hodder in any anything because there weren't magazines and that going around then you know it was there just wasn't you know the literature was very very sparse you were just out there fishing you didn't see it as a progression to go there you well, you wouldn't go from the local park to Yateley would you you know nowadays people just don't do that you know, you build yourself up slowly, but we we, we did it unknowingly, really, and then you know it's. Um, but you could see what was going on around you gradually. Then gradually, this, this place yeah, it's a bit special. I met I met a lot of locals up there. Um, all the local lads, Dickie Payne, um, Martin King, who's still up that way now, and they all became great friends. You know, they all ended up starting to come to Chelsea with us as well. We kidnapped them, and uh, took them on a few Chelsea adventures, which was brilliant. And um, well, that is your third love, anyway, uh, that, that, it, Vicky. That, that, is, that was yeah. what I was going to say. It's calmed down a bit nowadays, but it, it was really, really major right. for a lot of years. But um, yeah, but all all them guys were fishing, and they were all secret squirrels. And they, God forbid it, they already had stainless steel. I think Stevie Neville used to make bits up there. Then it was in very, again a long time ago, and um, so they had these stainless steel setups. And I used to think, tart, look at them, tarts everywhere, you know. But I got to know them, and we were in our Chelsea tops. And our skin tight jeans, you know, <laughs> uh, it was it was a joke really, you know. And we'd sit there and we'd go around with our match trolley pulling it along with like two crates of lager on it first, <laughs> sit that down and then go and get the gear and things like that. And our, you know, yeah. it was mad. But yep. you know, after a period of time, that they liked us and we liked them or whatever. But they they opened up a bit and they they'd been kept. But they were super super. They 
they, they would never put a tent up over them. They'd sleep under the stars all the time. This was in the early 80s, but everything was camo. They had netting at the front of the swim. It was another world from the Diana, which is basically a hole in the ground, a, a round Strange fountain. Strange place, really, wasn't yeah, it? Mad. Yeah. You know, so there was no need for any camo. Around. In fact, we used to play football around there, and all the local girls used to come down, and we used to, you know, a party with all the girls around there and things like that. So... It was it was um, to go to Yately was mad, but you you learnt and you enjoyed it, and then you just slightly getting onto the cops a little bit, which was a beautiful lake. Then over to the Pad Lake, you know, then over to the um, the North Lake. And Did you do much on the Match Lake as well? Then Match Lake I fished a lot. It's, yeah. my, it's still my favourite lake. Is it? Yeah, it's still my favourite yeah. lake. But in fairness, they like all them lakes had something. Mm. You know, they they all. I always used to say when you walk onto the pass, it used to make the air stand up on the back. You know, it used to you know you used to be inspired to go. Uh, early days we didn't really know what was in there I'm sure other people did but we didn't and in fairness the match date was mainly 20s mm. there hadn't been a 30 caught um, and in fact Phil Thompson caught the first known 30 that we know about in uh, 1990 and um, yeah, and we had a bottle of champagne for that, and many days of celebration. Why the match lake? Why why was that your favourite? I don't know. It's just the first one we came to. Um, we fished it right through the winter, and we were hardcore fishing for the winter then. I still do it now. I love me winter fishing, but uh, it was madness. Really, you didn't catch much, but it was just like I remember sitting on the bed, Lafuma bed chairs, like four of us under a forty-five inch brolly. And the Lafuma was touching the floor because there was four of us on it. And we'd sit there, we were listening to, I think it was Frank Bruno and Tyson fight and things oh, like yeah. that, you know. And it was it's just different. You had no social media then, no phones to look at. It was literally you drunk, you ate, and you fished. Mm. And you just talked, you know. And we were all young men, you know. My mate Macca was with us as well. And he was he was, he was was known for just setting his... He had a little red stall, which he's dead now. He died. He's a great mate of mine. Um... And he used to bring that little red stall into your swim. It's one of them ones like that with the legs. Oh, like yeah. That. And he used to sit because he was only tiny. And he only used to eat pot noodles and bacon sandwiches. Never ate anything else ever. And he used to smoke like a trooper and he used to drink like mad. Anyway, t- quite often I'd fall asleep two o'clock in the morning or whatever. And like four o'clock I'd wake up. He'd still be sat there chatting. Amazing. All the time. All yeah. the time. So, yeah, I miss, I miss them little chats now because he, 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 uh, he was a big part of Yately. Yeah, you know, with big pot. Not one of them yeah. ones that you've ever heard about who mm. was out there or or whatever or fishing for the big ones. Even he just loved the match lake. He mm. loved it. Mm. So yeah, that was good. You into? I mean, I know in Terry's book as well. He said about you mentioned you didn't he? and like you talked. You got to come and fish the match lake yeah. and stuff. So I mean, it's yeah. So do you think that you were like um, you were in the right place at the right time there for you know becoming a carp angler? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I do, but. But it comes along when it comes along, doesn't yeah. it? So, and I don't like to give that impression that they were the good old days all the time. They were. They, they were they good were. days. They were. were There's no I mean. doubt about it. <laughs> but, you know, the kids are still having it. The young, younger guys are having a good time now. You know, they're still having a good time. But that wild tide, most of them aren't. But there is a few places where they probably are. Mm. And they're probably keeping their lips sealed so that, you know, people like us don't find out. Mm. You know, and good luck to them. Yeah, but it was a whole it was a whole Yately kind of family thing on there. The atmosphere on the whole complex at that yeah. time must have been it was alive. phenomenal. You know the <clears throat> the going down the pub thing when someone caught the celebrations were, were were the best. I've never experienced it. I have experienced it on on certain other lakes, but nowadays you don't you don't really get that. You get a little group that might go down, but you don't get the whole lake disappear. You know, and um, we used to go down. Off, I think it was pizza. Uh, pizza face we used to call them yeah yeah. it was again very un pc at the time Mm. you know a little bit of bullying really but we didn't see it like that he he just had a spotty face so we called him pizza that was it you know um they called me thicky so i don't know why but they did um but we all sort of had nicknames and whatever but we used to go down i can't remember if it was a swan or one around the back and i'll never forget and me and tell talk about it all the time we wish we had had a picture of all them boots, moon boots, lined up outside. And it was just—it was just. I think it was on Boxing Day or something like that. I think I think he caught, I think he caught single scale first, and or or the orange or, or vice versa. Anyway, we went down and had this this party in there. It was just fantastic, absolutely. And we come running out afterwards at the end of it, as we always do. And everyone was putting on different boots. We all went back to the lake. People were in different people's bivvies, fast asleep, all that sort of stuff. So it was like the Wild West. And then obviously that story with Richie and, and, and the shoot at that time when he, you know, he literally, we were making a lot. We were singing Chelsea, anti-Man United songs, funny enough. And he was over on the Cops Lake and, and uh, all of a sudden he appeared out of the bushes. And uh, there was me, Jason Hayward, 
Mazza, Jacko, and someone else, I think. And um, literally, it, it just went off. I just see this big flash. It was loud, and we just stopped. And everyone just went at Richie. Just, what the f are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? You could have killed someone. I, I've heard years lately, Richie, Richie said that um, he stumbled as he walked in the swim. But, um, you know, and obviously it's so many years later now, there's no police involved or anything like that. But God, you get, you get locked you'd, you'd, away Yeah, you'd be locked away now. now. Oh you would do, God. yeah. I mean, we're talking 30 years ago mm. now, even longer. But, you know, it was amazing. But again, that story is still just like, you know, you tell people that now or they read it and, uh, and they just look at you in total disbelief. But it happened. Was that out of character for Richie? I no. mean, he, he did. No. <laughs> no. He was always a bit of a, I thought he was a bit of a gangster and what have you, and he was a bit like that, you know. But on the bank, you've met, you know, that's the mad thing about fishing, isn't it? You, I, we've met solicitors, you know, we've, you've, you've met um, jailbirds, you've met roofers, you've got posties, you've got scientists, you've got such a, it's a great leveller. Fishing, especially fishing there was a great level. Well, of I fish. like him because Yateley was close to Broadmoor as well, wasn't it? It so was. So you to get the at, stories of people escaping Well, I, I, I had a mate who worked in Broadmoor as well, who I met when I was on Welly years and years later, and, and, and he told me some of the stories. If I'd have known that when I was fishing there and that siren went off. But they did they get, there was a couple of escapes over the years, but mainly that alarm would go off on a Monday or a Tuesday, I think it was, or the alarm would go off and everyone would listen and we'd say, that's the Broadmoor. If you hear that and it's not this time of the day, run. <laughs> Sit the baby door up. Well, that's where the real nutters were, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah that's where the real nutters were. were, but, that's, were yeah, that's but it's just ironic that it was all at the same sort of place. Yeah, but, um, yeah. How, what made you stop fishing Yately then? Um, it got busy. I, I did move on to the car park very briefly, but there was, at that stage, which was quite rare, there was quite a few full-timers on there. So you, you didn't really get a choice of swims as such. You know, there was no ruling on time on there like there would be nowadays. Um, so, and I'll, I'll be truthful, for, for whatever reason, I never really felt it on there. I, I, the fish were lovely, but the lake never did it for me. And I, subsequently, years later, the lakes, the, that lake got better and better looking. You yeah. know, and it, it became quite a nice lake, but I, I, it just didn't have it for me. Mm. Maybe when they'd done that works bank, mm. it, it just whatever, I don't know. So, And it had got busy, and it was time to go. And, um, you know, I had a couple of other big lakes to fish. And then I went up to um, the Calm Valley and fished Pit 4, which was just glorious. I mean, absolutely glorious. I had a good look over Kingsmead when Kingsmead was joined. The two lakes were joined. You've got Kingsmead 1 and 2 now. And obviously they've got a few Simos and that in them now. They didn't have the Simos in then. Mm. Um, but that, that, was, uh, that was a mad place. And the reason I went over there, I saw um, there was a picture of John Holt and Richie Mack um, with a fish that's in a few of the books in Rod's book as well of um, this scaly one out of crayfish pool, which is next door, a little lake, and it disappeared, it got moved. And I just thought, I said, look, yeah, if, if I was there and I was gonna move it, where would I move it to? The big lake, without a doubt. And I looked and I looked and I, I saw another scaly one in there that was a gnome fish. Um, I forget, again, I forget what it was called. And I fished it a bit, done a little bit of time on there and what have you, um, but I never saw it. Never saw it, but I did see some truly wild commons in there spawning one time. You know, 25, 30 pounders that had never seen the bank as far as I knew, and they were jet black. And my mate went out in, onto these sand banks and got stuck, and the, the, the fish were literally spawning around him. So we had a good, you know, chance to see if there was anything extra special in there. But even now, you know, I know there's a few people that have fished it over the years have seen some, some ones that, that were in there. Not, not now, I don't think, mm. but certainly a few years back. But yeah. Was it getting fished that much then? No, Kingsmead wasn't. Yeah, Yateley was. It, was it, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yates. Yates was gone for me at that stage. Yeah, but but King... uh, again, we, we, you know, I moved off and a few of my friends moved on and what have you. But then you've got Lewis Reed, you've got Terry, Terry Detention, you, you've got various other people come through from all around the country and they took it on. I mean, you know, some of their pictures of the fish out of the car park and that are just outstanding, you know. Oh, they so, definitely took it on. Oh, <laughs> and, and, and the fish were then, weren't only in their prime like they were when we were on there, but they were in their prime because they were big mm. as well. Mm. And that went on for another seven or eight, ten years maybe before they started waning, looking old and just mm. slowly falling apart basically. Mm. You know, but um, so it went into another era, and that's what I always say: things move on. You know, and it's it's you know obviously it's now got a different owner, and it's got different fish in there and that. But it's producing big fish again. It now, is, isn't yeah, it? yeah. I know a few people that have fished it. You know, and again, I'm, I'm some not, big ones died in the, uh, the big one died in the North Lake, didn't it? They lost yeah. they lost a few fish. That's in right. There. Yeah, I mean, I, I hear a lot about it. Mm. I don't keep tabs on it or anything, but 
you know, I hear the odd angler saying Raysbury ain't what it used to be. You know, um, Yateley's not what it used to be. Of course it isn't. It's, it's 30 no. years later, lads. Mm. You know, it is what it is. And at least it's not a building site, you know. But them guys that are on there, the amount I've met over the years, it's still sort of like, oh, it's Yateley, it's Yateley. And that's good. Yeah. You know, good luck to yeah. You know, it's, it, it, at least they're, they're buzzed up. They're, they're, they're feeling, you know, they're feeling something. They're, they're feeling the air stand up on the back of their neck, neck because of the old history mm. of the place. You know, and again, fair play to when, in, in, this, in the late seventies when other people must have been on there, and then the early eighties when we were on there, that was making the history. And them guys are probably making history there now. Them fish would be fished for for the next twenty, thirty years. But it's just there's a lot more carp around now. You know, so that history them history fish have, are going and gone more or less mm. you've got so many lakes now you know what i call super lakes that have got such good stocks you know and that's what's changed and that's the uh, there are places with not too many fish in still you fancy fishing those sort of super lakes you know like your grenville well no no not like not not grenville's down appeal to me no it's a few two simos in there as well although there's some good looking carp in there as well i, I and you but you know dinton i class as, uh, as a super water you know, it's one of them ones that's got a good stock of fish. The stock is looked after, and it is what it is. You know, mm. and it's it's heavily fished now. Mm. You know, but you know they are lovely fish. You know, and I can understand it, but sometimes you get that urge just to have somewhere quieter where there's just a few of you, and there's only a handful of fishing. You know, and again, I, I got someone give me a picture the last couple of days, and I told you about it. And I've seen it, and it's just done my nothing. And I know I'm too old now. I'm 55. I, I know I, I've, I've got to clamber through brambles to get there. I've got to get bits in a boat. Well, I need I need the QE2 to get my gear around, <laughs> as you saw the other week when we were down Denton. You know, I, I've got so much gear, to, the comforts I need, you know, just to even survive on the bank now with your back and whatever. So it's, it's you know, I know I shouldn't be do, thinking so it. So do you think that need will just override all that? No, I think I'll go and do it. Yeah, it sounds like I, it. I, I, I'm not saying it'll be that one, but I, I, I've got no doubt I will go yeah. and do it. You know, do, or do something. You, you know. mentioned um, Raysbury as well. You said that Raysbury could have finished your marriage. Yep. Did you fish that for very long? Mm, probably two years on and off. And again, I, I didn't feel like I was playing at it, you know, because uh, my mate Phil had fished it. Laney, Laney was on there just before and that. And we just went out. It was, it was mad. Again, that was another lawless place. Um, which is why we liked it. And there was only, I think when I went on there, there was 13 left in there. There was 16 a couple of years before. Um, I ended up getting a couple of bites out of there and I ended up losing one. And, you know, leaving your car there was a nightmare. I know Laney said he used to leave all his doors open and it was piled up with rubbish so they never used to touch it. <laughs> but, you know, I often used to get the missus to drop me off. I was only doing one night a week then and a bit of holiday and I, I muffed a couple of chances on floaters as well and eventually I got the bite on the bottom and again that's hairs on the back of your neck moment um, literally you can't hear nothing when the planes come over so I'm sitting there and I thought I heard this and I sort of looked around like that and I just said massive massive rings right on top of me spot and I thought oh my god that's got to be a carp it's got to be anyway a few minutes later I had this bite I've hit it and it's just gone 80 yards straight off on the surface and at the time I didn't think anything about it it was only subsequently people said what fish does that in there so it's just stripped me 80 yards come down the side of the sailing club all the way back in front eventually I've got it in there. it's just it's a big lump I could see it I was stood out on the ledge and then it goes down to about 10 foot quite quick and I was pulling it up like that and I could see it coming up through the depths and I could see it was a sandy colour Mary colour I didn't know it was Mary, and I, I can't even to this day say to you it was. Other people have actually put their words into my mouth, but I literally went like that, and as it started coming out, I thought, Jesus Christ, my first Raysbury carp, I got the land in there, and the second I thought that, the hook sprang out, and the lead went behind me. That's how close it was, all right? So I stood there, I thought, oh, my God, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. So obviously I've told a few people, and they, everyone to a man has just said, that's Mary, that's what she does, that's Mary. It didn't make me feel any better and um not really i went to pack up and everything eventually and i went back to the car and there, my missus was there with the car waiting there, and there's a bloke just going like this on a lorry in the lay by with a crowbar and she i can't remember whether she was just had the second one or was heavily pregnant with a second child and the other one was only one they weren't sleeping and whatever and during this little period where i was taking a bit of holiday i was trying to do three days and um she was crying, got home, and she, you could tell she was really stressed. Now, years later, now, you know, a grown man now, you sort of realise all these things. 
and I was quite ashamed in many ways, but I sort of looked at her and she was really, she goes, you can't carry on like, like you are. You can't do this. I've got two young kids. You can't just go for a wander around the lake. Because I've obviously raised me. When you went for a wander, it took four or five hours. Mm. And even though I was a postie finishing early in the morning, she was going to work. Six weeks later, she's back at work. Mm. So I sort of looked and I remember I had one parrot on here, one parrot on there. And they were just like, one was saying, do this. Go on, tell her to fuck off. And the other one was saying, whatever, you know, don't, don't, don't. Luckily, I did the, did the proper... The prop, right oh, right. thank God. Thank God I did. Because I do look at people around now and I do think to myself, nah. Yeah. You know, and, you know, mortgage is paid. You've got, you've got a pension. You've got kids that love you. You know, far more important than fishing. Fishing is and always has been a hobby. Mm. and must be. I don't even call it a sport. I still call it, especially carp fishing. For me, it's a hobby, mm. you know, and, and long may that continue. But yeah, if you, you know, many people make probably the wrong decision at some stage and lose everything. Yeah, you, well, you hear it a lot. You do, yeah. Thank God I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, thank God I didn't. So it was easy to walk away from there and just think, like, forget it. Weren't about easy. That place. It weren't easy. It weren't easy. <laughs> no, it weren't easy because I wanted, you know, I wanted to be, you know, like my mate Phil and Jacko carried on and Jacko, you know, Jacko done a lot of personal sacrifices fishing there and he caught um i don't think he caught mary but he, he caught oh yeah he caught malins he caught mary's mate in a day apart and i remember uh i think that, yeah sheila had just been born and i remember going down there and having her in the carry cot and my missus where are you going i said i'm going down to raise she said you can't i said i've got to go and congratulate him and she didn't she you know and she said really and i said really this is amazing amazing he's caught them two fish <laughs> malins and mary's mate and it was it just blew your mind so down there i went and you know sat there with him and i remember chili had been up all night celebrating with jacko and chili was lying on his bed chair and had wet himself <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> so they'd obviously had a good night, had a good night. but that that yeah. was how you know you i had to go and say well even now I, I was i was i didn't want to go down the lake i wanted to sit there at home and everything to be sweet but i ended up taking little kitty little sheila down there at the time and doing it you know, and um, that's how obsessed you were. Why did you always stay uh, be, being a postman? Yeah. I mean, you could have easily maybe gone and tried to find something else where you um, could have worked. I don't know. I, li more. I liked being a postman, really. Yeah. I loved it. I didn't like the hours, you know, and I had no skills, you know, I had no qualifications or anything. You know, it's like, like my son now. I know a lot of the jobs like mine are gone now. It's a rubbish job now. Mm. You know, it's rubbish. It used to be very, very good, but it's uh, it's, it's gone. So I wouldn't want my son to not do anything at school or not do anything at college because I know that you're not going to earn the money doing that, whereas we earned the money doing it there. Um, so, you know, we made, not made him, but we got him to go down the line of being a plumber, which he's now qualified. My daughter's doing teaching. So, you know, it's all, it's all, that's all for the better. But I, I, there was nothing else for me to do, really. I could have been labouring or something, but I think I just, I just ended up doing it. And it's been a good one, really good one. And, and the story that I forgot with Basil, was how many of them staff knew my obsession. And they'd say, what are them things that you're, you're putting in the freezer? And they were boilies at work or whatever, or I was rolling baits or I was tying rigs up. I was doing something. And they all sort of understood there was this thing that I did. And uh, when I caught her and I went back to work after that week was over, I remember they got me in a coffin and I went round. I had nothing on, just my pair of shorts. And I was just standing there, basil, basil, basil. And the whole office was just basil, basil. And it was just mad it's crazy but they could understand that obsession in your eyes and that you know coming in in the morning and you're stinking of fish or you're tired and the car's just full of fishing gear you know they, they knew the levels that we went to to go fishing so and they heard many of the stories and when i'd done the first book when i'd done a merry old dance it was just i gave them a, i gave some of them a copy for nothing and other people i charged them 20 quid or whatever like, like 10 pound less or whatever and one of the blokes, you know, a lot of them probably wouldn't read it, but there was a lot in there about family life and what have you. So one of the blokes read it, and he is married to a girl who works with us as well. And he came in in the morning and he went, Mick, I want to take up fishing. I said, you're joking. He said, can I come with you? I said, yeah, of course you can, mate. I said, well, where do you want to go? He said, can I go to that pit four place? <laughs> I said, well, what is that? He said... You're, you're never fishing. You go for one night. You end up in the pub. You're eating, drinking, uh, eating, eating curry, drinking beer, going to the strippers, coming back and going to whatever parties in the horse and barge. He even knew the horse and barge's name. Did he? Yeah, it was brilliant. Yeah. So he'd obviously read it word for word, and that 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 was funny as well, like you know. Yeah. And the, another mad one on that. 
I gave him that book and I put in it to Mr. and Mrs. Wallace. They're good friends of mine at work and they still work for us now. And a couple of years ago, he said, have you seen how much your book's worth on the old internet? I saw it yesterday, actually. He, at the time, it was 80 quid, I think. Right. Uh, it was a few years back. So he's gone, 80 quid, man. I said, oh, right. I said, yeah, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's yours, you know. It's a, something to be proud. He bloody sold it. He sold <laughs> it for 80 quid, and some mugs bought it with Mr. and Mrs. Wallace written on it. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Oh, actually, it's got to, like, write in book. I mean, so... Did you ever envisage yourself writing a book when nah, you were younger? No, nah, no. Nah. <laughs> I was, believe it or not, a lot of the lads are going to laugh. I can hear Terry Peff laughing in my ears now, petrol breath. I was good at poetry at school. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. And I was good at English. And then it sort of got beat, not beaten out of you physically, but beaten out of you by a teacher because your spelling wasn't great and what have you. It, it, it just went and I never did it. And then when I picked up that pen to write that, I mean, it, Again, I'm not a writer. I'm not stupid enough to know that. You know, I'm not flowery with words, and it's written from there, and it's written how I speak, basically. Um, but, yeah, I've done the first three chapters, sent them to me mate Brooksy and the other mate at work who's a non-angler, and they both read it, and every, every line was read with spelling mistakes. I mean, absolutely bad, 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 bad. And, um, yeah, they, they, Brooksy put on it, A1, Mick, you've got to carry on, something along them lines, and, and I did, and it's uh, it was very good experience yeah very good experience mm. you know it was it was quite humbling you find it's changed the course of things a little bit since then uh no not really it's just it's just, it's just yeah it, no well it, you've had to come out of the uh, you ha yeah, shadows a little bit yeah you did i've got a little bit you know like, like some of the things i've read you know i've got a little bit of a stick for for certain places and what have you but all of them were long after the fish were gone and and what have you and you know even now you know in the in that book there the last one i um I didn't write certain things because I was fish there was two two places I couldn't write about, you know. Mm. So I didn't, you know. And if God forbid I ever do another one, which I'm not sure I ever will, um, you know, that there's places in there that I will never write about. Mm. As long as you're not allowed to write about them, I won't write about them. I'll, I'll it, always play that game. Yeah, yeah. You know, right. but even then, it doesn't matter what you do in life. Someone's going to criticise, you know. So you're always going to get that. But I'm glad I did it. You know, and well, it, so we all, we were all glad. Well, to, I it, mean, when when yeah. when we heard Mickey Gray was writing a yeah. book, you knew it was going to be a good yeah. read when yeah. it came. Was it a friend, your your friend that passed away that um, yeah. influenced your decision to write a book? Yeah, there was him, and my, my, my wife was always saying it. You should, you've got to write one. You've got to write one. You know, some of the stories and the obsession. If you can put pen to paper and carry it off and make you know it, it carry what you know what you're like, it, it could be good. And and um, but Macca. Um, I'd, I'd done it, and I took it to him, and it was literally, I printed it all off on A4 papers, every single one, and um, literally, so he had a pile of A4 paper written like that, without no pictures, and he read it, and he said, you, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you've got to do it, you know, and it was obviously at a later date, I sort of had to do another chapter, which unfortunately was his 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 death, which was uh, pretty was savage. old, Mick, was he? He was, I think he was 34. God he was 34. Man. It was throat cancer and what have you. But we used to have a memorial over on um, on uh, the match late for him for a few years, which was really good. He's got a headstone over there. And a couple of lads still look after it over there now for us, even though it's owned by, I think it's, um, it's Farnham now. But mm. they do it. But, yeah, yeah, it was always always very sad. But, then, you know, I've only got good memories of him. And one of, one of my final memories of him was uh, he was near the end. And he was laying in the old hospice and we got him next to a goldfish pole. And, and there, outside there was a pond and there was loads of goldfish in it. Like, And um, he loved it. And he was sat there and I was talking to his mum. And his mum's sort of got gingery blonde hair like me sort of thing. And um, I forget what, how it came up. I said, uh, yeah, I said, uh, I said, I was still using the old L'Oreal. I always dyed my hair since I was a kid, since I was 16. So I don't even know what colour my hair is. I suspect it's grey underneath now. <laughs> but as you go by the beard... But all of a sudden, he sat bolt upright in the bed, like that, and he's looked at me. He said, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to swear." He said, "You fucking puff." <laughs> all right, very un PC. But that he was shocked, and I said to him, "Matt, I've always died it, mate. You must have known that back, back in the early '80s and all that." And he's gone, "I never knew." So you know, and again, a magical moment and one of the last moments, you know. But yeah, what a moment. We, we had a, Great send off, loads and loads of the old Yateley crew came out, loads and loads. It was a massive, mass. You know, it was fantastic. Mm. So, yeah, you still, you still, you know, you look back and you've got fond memories, but you still think that's too young. 
things. God, too, yeah. yeah. But then, you know, life, yeah, life it, goes on. Life does go on. It does. And what about the whole pro? I mean, you said, you know, getting the book deal and stuff like that was a bit of a process for you as well. To- yeah, yeah. The first one, um, I don't know if I should talk prices, but I, I think, I think. I was basically, it was about, I remember when I was unknown to uh, Tony Cliff and Mulders, who, who, who published it for me, Empress. And so I had to stump up the money, or a lot of the money, and I think it was about 37 grand. And it's um, a lot of money. It's a isn't lot it? of money. Oh, and I, anyway, I was well short for whatever reason. And I was thinking, how am I going to do this? And yeah, a certain person stumped the money up for me in cash. Wow. And I remember driving to Romford, just up the road from here, and I'd never been through the Dartford Tunnel ever. And anyway, it was a pissing wet day, absolutely pouring down. And I've got the money, because it's 12 grand, and we're talking now, how many years ago now? Was that 13, 13 years, years ago? Yeah. It's It's stuffed in a way that I thought, if I get pulled with 12 <laughs> grand off, they're going to ask me, and my, my friend who who gave me, lent me the money, he said, if you get caught with it, you, you've got it from under your own bed. Okay, no <laughs> problems. So I went out there, anyway, handed the money over, whatever, done all that. But on the way there, there was a roadblock at Isha, which was oh, quite near my house. No. <laughs> and I looked, and the road was blocked. The police were there doing whatever, and they were pulling one over, one in, one out, one over, one out. And I was looking, I said, no, no, no. And luckily, they sent me on. <laughs> then I got past, is it Clackett Services on the way back, on the way down there? So I got there, and it was peeing with rain, and the oil light came on my car. Oh, my God. So I had to get out in the peeing rain, and I'm nervous as hell going down to see this mythical Cliff Mulder who was like a, I don't know how to describe him really, but he was like only a small man, but he had great stature, you know, and, and he was, it was to me it was like an Essex mobster or something. And they all are, they were the dentist part of the world. So um, I, anyway, I literally, I, I went through, I, 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 went, I went to the, I filled up with the oil and whatever, got, got to there, and I thought, I'm early now, so I went into a calf, and I thought, well, I can't walk in there with the waders stuffed with 12 grand in this local <laughs> cafe in Romford. Yeah. All right? And there were some right dodgy characters. It was 7 o'clock in the morning. So I thought, so I tried to park it outside. It was just out of view. Like, so I was sort of like sitting there, like eating my bricks and going like that. <laughs> and eventually I pulled into this car park, and it was still an hour before Tony and, um, and Cliff were going to turn up. And then they turned up, and I went in, and we sat down, and money was done and agreed. Everything was agreed and what have you. And, and it was brilliant absolutely brilliant and a great experience to see how all that sort of stuff worked and yeah I, ne- I never thought it'd be me I never thought even you know even doing the chapter for Tell's book um, I, I never thought it would lead on lead on to, to, to doing that mm. you know I really didn't but, didn't uh, you really no but it's done it's done and you yeah. know you know it's uh we're sitting here years and years later and I, you know still say i'm very proud i'd like to say successful enough to go and write a second one as yep, well because not, not not too many people have done that yep, have they, either? no no it's um yeah and again different books again when you're doing this fishing you're not necessarily thinking i'm doing this to write a book it's just no, do you know no. what i've got i've got no. more uh, content here i can yeah that's it exactly that i mean you know the first one had a lot of a lot of the a lot of the naughtier side of carp fishing in, you know, and then the second one, you know, you were on lakes where if you behave too badly, we did, and you can read in between the lines in that, you know, and it becomes more of a like I sort of you really get on it then. I'm getting more time and you're going more often and the kids are growing up, but they come into the story so many times, mm. you know, so many times. They they do. They do. And and again that's that's the human side of how many t- and now sitting there and able to more or less go three days every single week, the amount of lads I meet that are doing one night a week or overnighters or whatever. And, you know, I haven't seen you for a couple of weeks. Yeah, the nipper was ill. And I, I, I know that, you know, and I, they're the ones you still admire more than anything because they're out there doing it. They're out there doing it still. And I always said, even if you can only do one night a week while your kids are growing up, while you're ill or whatever, if you can do one night a week and through the winter, that's 52 nights a year. Mm. And in 52 nights, even on the hardest lakes, which mm. we used to fish, mainly hard lakes, mm you could get three or four bites mm. in that time. So it is worth it. You know, you've got to get lucky for it to be one of the big ones. But even so, that, that, was, that was how I did it for many years. But now, you know, I can sit there and you've got three days every week. It's, you know, yeah. it's so much um, easier to sp- put stuff together. I mean, you get, especially with this book as well, you, um, you had a big thing for leanies in this book, didn't you? It's, yeah. You know, because, you know, they're, yeah. they're, those fish are disappearing yeah. now. I yeah. mean, do you really need that kind of incentive to want to get out and go fishing? Is there something in particular that really drives you to... The leany thing, I can't remember 
Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. There was there was a look there was a little lake that two blokes I know were fishing. One of them was a good mate who was fishing with me on Ollybush, and um, they'd been poaching it, and um, that that started getting me mind thinking about leanies and what have you. And then I looked into it, and I'd always, and again, I'm going back to I think it was 1984. I got in a car and I was at Yateley, and I think Richie Mack. Had his, um, his Coleman's or his burner had blown up and he kicked it in the lake because it was just, and he kicked it in the lake like Generate, and he was telling me how good it was as well <laughs> you know, and he's, he's kicked it in the lake so I gave him a lift up to this tackle shop and it was Ashfell and Tackle Up and I remember going in there and I think it was that year or a year or two later there was, a, there was two cases and there was two leanies and I knew, I knew about what, what I call it the golden mile so I'll carry on calling it the golden mile mm. um, even though most of them are dead now um, and I saw these two cases, I thought, look at them. And then somebody on Yateley, and I think it might have been Robin Dix, who's an old Yateley name from years ago, someone showed me two pictures of the two two fish out there, one called the Longy and one called the Double Row. And they fixated in my mind, and they were there. But Yateley was the build and end all at that time, to me. So I carried on my Yateley adventures for another eight or nine years, then went elsewhere, all different places around the country, Cotswolds, wherever, Colne Valley, done different thing. And then it was a, it was just after I'd done the book, the first book, it was 2007, and I thought to myself, I haven't got a lot of time this year. I know a little leany lake called Hollybush. I'm going to go and fish there. Now, at that time, the biggest fish I knew that was in there was £31, um, but they were leanies, and they were pretty. And it weren't busy, and I knew, and I, I got on the syndicate anyway, kindly let on the syndicate by Charlie and Simon, who were proper old stalwarts for around that area, and it was the most beautiful lake, just 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 outside Farnborough, it was beautiful, you know, and it was just, it was overgrown, there was lily pads everywhere, <clears throat> it was like channels and back channels and bays, and what a place to get lost, you know, from the moment I walked around there, I thought this is it. And it was. It was pure, pure fishing with none of the old big bollocks. Was this the Owls? Which the one? Owls Lake. The Owls Lake. The one we call the Owls Lake. Yeah, when you were cut, you do get, you really do sense you that. You do. In the book. It, it was. I mean, I, I know in that one, I wrote about my walk around the first yeah. time I went there. And a you lot. kind of got lost walking around. Exactly. There. Exactly. And that's what it was actually like. And um, there was none of this big fish stuff going on. It was just pure syndicate. And I loved it. And I caught uh, my, my first fish. No, not my first fish. Second fish, I think it was. I caught a 35-pound leany out of there that was just, oh, my God. Just jet black. All its back was black. It was like big scales like that. It was just phenomenal, you know. And um, it just went on. I caught there was another one in there as well. And then the, the smaller ones were beautiful, 28s, 29s, just stunning fish. But they meant it, and it, it sort of spawned from there. Mm. Then I started. Then I got me, then I got me, me um, golden mile ticket. Mm. And I started looking at that, and I remember the first time I walked around that, I took my boy with me, and we done it. We went to do a lap, and I was walking around. And I know it's it was very hostile down there. They don't they don't Sounds want like they, it. they don't want anyone yeah. there, and they don't they didn't want me there, especially as I'd just written a book. So that was the the, the worst thing in their their mind to happen. But what they didn't know is a quite a few of the lads on there. I I, I knew a couple of them, a couple of the old boys, uh, that had been a little bit protective in the past. Um, and I walked around and I bumped into one of them straight away. He heard my boy climbing a tree behind his swim, looked out like that, and it was an old mate of mine called Steve, and um, Steve Templer, we call him the saint. And uh, he said, hello, mate, blimey. And it must have been 25 years, must have been. So m maybe more. So we sat down, had a quick chat, and I said, he said, are you thinking of fishing here? I said, yeah, I'm, well, the next couple of weeks I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a go. So I got my ticket, and I got a bit of a hostile reception the first time down mm. there. Some bloke in the car park started going on, don't want your salt down here and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, bloody hell. Um, so, you know, we didn't come to blows or nothing, but, you know, I told <laughs> your you. Your salt, I mean, yeah. they'd never even met you. I oh, I know. And, and that, that's the thing. I'd written a book from the heart, but for some reason, you know, I, I, you know, fair enough. And one of them actually said to me at one stage, you're going to bring that Terry Earn down there. And I remember saying to him, he don't even know I'm fishing here. And what do you think he is, my bloody brother? <laughs> you know, I speak to him four or five times a year at that stage, you know. So, you know, I know Till well, and he's a good old friend. But, you know, we're not blood brothers or anything. But, yeah, it was, it was you know, and I wouldn't tell Till anyway. 
I don't want him on there. What do I want him on there for? He's going to catch them all before me. You know, he's that he's that good, and he, you know he's got that ability to do that. No, thank you. I'll, I'll leave it. But Tell normally knows what you're up to anyway. You know, there's not a lot Tell don't know that's going on. So, you know, but it was it was a great place, and I did like it. And I formed a good friendship with some of the old original lot that the boys that were still on there that had fished it for donkeys years. Most of them are banned now, funnily enough, and um, for misbehaving. Um, but yeah, but uh, you know, it's just little things. You know. I couldn't use barbed hooks because you weren't allowed to um but but i knew certain people were but i knew if i got caught they'd ban me um you weren't allowed to drink on the lake and all that which i didn't do for a, a, that's probably where my drinking habits changed from being a big drinker on the lake all them years mm. to to cutting it out a lot mm. so in some ways it was a bit of a godsend i did drink mm. occasionally but i didn't want to get caught down there with a can in my hand because i knew i knew they'd ban you because mm. there's no there's an, uh, no alcohol ban and that club are, are quite hot on it which is fair enough that's their rules so yeah and it just again it went from there i went over to um the mighty summerlees i was gonna say because you said around 2012 didn't you you, yeah. you sent me um an email with these yeah. pictures and you said yeah. that was the greatest years fishing of that, your life that that was 2009 sorry that was 2009 yeah um yeah that was a mad mad year so you were fishing summerlees at the time Yes, I was into my second year on Summerlees and probably my second year having a go at Frencham. And um, I got, I think it was May time, remembering this this was probably the last lean he left in there. There was no other leans. I thought there was, but they've never materialised since. I think one's been caught since, but one of the plainer ones, funnily enough. But apart from that, it was the last, I called it one of the last of the leanies and it had been restocked a couple of times and I was thinking oh no he's putting all these little ones in there but again he had to them fish now are making it a good lake again yeah. but um, yeah I caught it Ma- again magic you know 45 pound of, of oh, I think it was a 19, 1964 Lini apparently um, mega so carp wasn't mega it, mega one? carp and That's Garthy come down for me Garthy who used to work for you lot yeah. as well he, 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 he come down done the picture it was magic 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 magic, magic place and it was fishing on your own terms. There was no loads of people. Was it just that carp though? Once you caught that carp on that lake, it was for me personally. It was. It was. It was the leany. Got a picture thing. of that one, Tobe. It was the leany thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. The, it was the leany thing that was um, that was still biting strong. And we've uh, done two podcasts on the bounce now. And Ian yeah. Russell and yourself. Ha- you yes. Both, um, yeah. Well, Ian, Ian, and a couple of others had it quite a little in- instrumental. Look, at, look that. at that. Oh yeah. Look at that. Mm. Oh my God, my nose is my nose is huge. Out. My nose is huge. No wonder why I can't get them COVID masks on. But, <laughs> a bit uh, red there as well, Mick, isn't it? That's always the case. Yeah, is it? yeah, yeah it always. Was the, well, a lot of people say it's the red wine side, but uh, <laughs> funny enough, Damon did say he had unlimited bar here for me, but it's not here. He got me oh, here he, under he, false pretenses. He must have drank everything. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll get on to him. <laughs> it's a no, beauty, it's, like, an iconic carp again. And yes, another, another, yep. another very well-known. And fish. again, the reason why it was iconic for me is because it was in um, Martin Clark's book on the front that was I the mean one, wasn't what it? a picture you know what I and love that picture I found out subsequently really 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 sad for me but I don't know whether I'd have gone there because I was elsewhere at the time but I did try and get on there uh, a good few years earlier when the other 16 or so were alive before the fish kill and um, eventually when I got on there Dave who runs it a good friend of mine he um, he looked he showed me the logbook that was being run by the bloke who used to run it called Richard Prochowski, I think his name was. And he showed me it and it had all the names of the people and I, I won't name, but there's a few people where it had a cross next to them. They were never going to get a ticket. They tried to and it was they were crossed. Quite well known anglers as well. And then it come all the way down, it come to me in about two thousand two thousand ish, something like that. And literally it said no full no no number and no address. They couldn't get hold of me. <laughs> You would have gotten there all those years before. Or? Oh, God, I've missed out. But I mean, I, I was probably elsewhere, so I probably wouldn't have gone anyway. But, you know, and it made this, it made that fishing there for them two years all the better. And I was literally, there was a couple of local, and Nigel was there, who was a lovely, lovely bloke. Dave fished it. 
um, a few of them, and that they were all good lads. And we just done our own thing, and no one trod on each other's toes because we had the space to do that. It was fantastic. Was it like sixty odd acres that lake? Yes, yeah. um, I think. I think I try, I try and visualise because you can't get whole pictures of it. No, that's just one and, bit. That's one yeah. far end. That is, mm. and it goes right around here. They're actually still digging it now, and it's, mm. it's grown now. It's even bigger now. Um, they're, they're digging all the way back to Cookham now. I Did they have the publicity ban on there when you were fishing there? Was it? Uh. Do you know what? I couldn't tell you. I know, I know obviously, to, to publicise that, I asked Dave, so, mm. and, you know, and he said yes. And there was a publicity ban on there, there wasn't I don't there? know. I don't oh, know. Oh, maybe there was Because wasn't. obviously Martin Clark done it, so I don't did, know. Did Martin actually name the lake in his, in his book? I don't know. I need no, to read it again know. now. No, I don't know. No, yeah. there wasn't when I was on there. But uh, like again, I, I asked Dave just out of courtesy anyway, mm. and he was good. Maybe I didn't mention the name of it. I don't know. Mm. But yeah, it was uh, it, it, it was it was a mad old place. And then literally, mm. I thought it's May, May the first, May the second. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, I'm going to fish now for a little while. So I got another ticket for another leanie that had a few old leanies in it. I went there. And um, the first time I walked around there, I could see everyone was using bait boats and dropping baits out. And I thought to myself, well, that, I ain't going to do that. I won't use a bait boat anyway. So I started, um, I started baiting up and just literally firing boilies everywhere in this certain area. And it was a very grassy swim that didn't look like it was hardly being fished. So I thought that'd do. Went back down a few days later. And during the night, I was getting all these liners. I thought, I'm going to catch one. But four o'clock in the morning, bang. 41 pound common i thought oh my god <laughs> how's your luck so that do me so i, th I thought you know, i really want to go back and have a go on nutty lane now nutty lane was was all for, you know from the year 2000 and even for a few years before that when my mate steve barnard red phil tomo and that fished it you know was somewhere that was dear to my heart in many ways and it was it was a bastard of a lake it's mm. the hardest lake i've ever fished um you know other people might not might not have had it as hard or whatever but for me it was hard and i didn't again didn't do the time in them days so the first time i fished it the year 2000 i've done about four years on there on and off i was fishing other places but i drift in normally in the early part of the close season because the weed wasn't up and the water hadn't gone green and i used to get illed all the time there were so many eels in there um parking your car was a nightmare getting your gear to the lake was a nightmare but it was wild it was proper wild mm. and there was only a handful of fish in there in fact the first time i walked around it in 2000 i, find, I found five dead fish mm. um up to about 22 but they were old looking commons and what have you so i knew there was um a couple of decent fish in there did mid they have an out of bounds area there or something no, fish? Right, no, okay, no so out of bounds there but right. it, there was a couple of mid 30s in there um or my mate had had one at 33 something like that so i started fishing it and long story very long story short for four years, um, I never caught anything. I saw them. I soon realised there was three in there um, that would look all looking like they were 35 to 40 pound. And then one year, I saw this fish come in that's now dead, had a twisted mouth that was 32 pound, and it, it, it died And just afterwards. But the fish that was with it, I saw really well. And, I, and I, I didn't know which one it was. I just used to call it the warrior because it was all scarred up and it was just a huge lump. It was waddling. It was so fat. And I looked at it and I thought, that's got to be 42, 43 mm. pounds. But my mate Phil had seen it as well, Phil Tomo. He'd seen it and um, he started feeding it. And in this certain way away from our normal little areas and he was feeding it hemp, hemp, hemp. Six weeks he fed it. Six weeks it had come in and over and it all up. Mm. And on the sixth week, he said, I'm going to fish for it. He lowered his bait in, lowered it down, put the line down like that. It's come in. It's twigged something, and it's just gone. Whoo, after six weeks of baiting, oh. shot out. It never, ever came back. Didn't it? <laughs> now, we talked about it. <clears throat> I don't know everybody who was fishing. There was only a handful. I think we only there was only nine tickets sold that year, um, and four of them were pike anglers. So I don't know anyone else who was there. But I knew there'd been a fish at £24 caught a few years earlier by Tony Parker, who used to fish it. And um, so I, I knew there was a chance that this was that fish. And I didn't see it again. I saw a couple of times I saw another one, but not well enough to see it like that. But I knew it was there. I knew it was there. Moving on 2004, I'd, um, I literally went down there and I'd set up and I was using tigers and... I was fishing on this back of this bar and all the line was sunk, everything's concealing it and what have you. And 
Ben, a mate of mine, has been through a lot of personal grief with one thing or another, and he came down to see me, and I hadn't seen him for quite some time. And it was quite a serious conversation. And while we were there, there was a beep. Now, when you get a beep on there, it's a miracle. You know, it's a beep. You know, and we sat there. I said, do you know what? I think there's something out there. There's something. And, and you ultimately started, you know, we've probably done this a thousand times, and it ends up being an ill. I don't know. But we sat there, and we talked to him until that, and then beep again. What the hell's going on? All of a sudden, it's whacked up and whatever, and I've hit it, and I'm next to these snags, and I literally know I've just got to haul it away, and it's kiting like that towards them, and as it kited, it snapped all the branches on the end, because they're old trees, it snapped all the branches on the end, and then I've got it in front of me, and it rolled here. He hasn't carp fished for quite a few years, he didn't at the time. I go, grab the net! I said, net it! And it's literally floundering in front of me, I ain't got time to think about going on another run, and he's literally gone, oh, I've gone, Ben! And I've been talking to him about it an hour earlier, I said, it's her. He said, how do you know? I said, net it, net it. He's netted it. Anyway, he's freaked out. He's gone. He's left the lake. I'm ringing my other mate. I'll ring Martin King to come down and a couple of the other lads and they came down. We'd done the pictures and what have you. But again, that fish, to my, I think it was nine years it hadn't been caught since mm. it was 24 pounders, to my knowledge. My God. You know, so, and but overslung mouth, just a mad old looking fish. You know, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant stuff. I'll put your up toe for that one. That's I'll say it. it's, it's, a, it's an awesome carp. Yes, that's the really deep one. Mm. Really deep one. Yeah. If yeah. you find a picture of it there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, but the funny thing is, a week before that, where I'd been fishing a, a big lake. Ah, uh, that's the that's the latter one. Yeah. That's the one I ended up going back for, and. Um, and that was 2009. It comes in just after the Common and the Big Fully. And I literally went down there. Apparently they'd spawned, so there was no one really there. And at that stage, she was been caught at 48 pound earlier on in the spring, apparently. But by this stage, I think it was June, it was June the 16th. And I, so I started baiting it. I'd done three weeks worth of baiting. And I caught a, I caught a Common that um, was a mad looking old thing. And then I had that one morning in an electric storm. It had been stormed all night. One of them, again, hairs on the, you know, standing up on your neck, and it ripped off, and it was her. And as I saw her, it was in a weed on this spot. I knew it was solid underneath from years ago, but the weed was hitting the surface. And where I'd baited it and baited it and baited it and baited it three weeks, it had gone down all the way down to the bottom, and I was getting bang. So I knew they were on it. I knew I was going to catch. I didn't know I was going to catch that one, but I was hoping because there's hardly anything in there. And when I hooked it, she comes straight to the surface in the weed and she just head in the load of weed. So I just bought in a ball of weed, but I could see her back out of the water and I could see all them big scales all along the back. So I knew which fish it was all the way in. And that was one we called Daisy and she was uh, just under 44 pound. She's got an un under slung mouth and everything. Oh, like, oh my just, God, just look at that. That lake for me was just like, oh. And it was hard. for me. It was hard. It beat me up so many times. Mm. You know, so many false dawns on there. And my mates had fished it as well and had a go. Some of them had failed. A couple of them had got lucky a few times as well and caught. Um, but yeah, that that was brilliant. But just before I caught that, the, the big deep one, the grey one, which is the first one. Yes, that's coming up. Nope. <laughs> no, that's okay. We haven't got that one. Actually. Nope. So anyway, just before that one. Um, Literally, I'd been on the Ellis Lake, and I'd fished the Ellis Lake on and off for 15 years. And again, it seems, you know, I don't go to every lake and catch everything, all the big ones. I often get bored early, or it gets, you know, the lake changes, a lot of people come on, and you see a few people come on, and you think, no, nah, I don't like this no more, I'm going elsewhere. And so I'm never one to completely do a lake in any shape or form. Um, but the Ellis Lake, I'd fished on and off for 15 years, had a lot of the old fish out of there, and the big, big one, the pretty one, um, was one that was just called a Kingsmead fish. And um, I wanted it bad, and I caught that a week before I caught this big old grey one that hadn't been out for nine years out of Nutty Lane. Good and boy. again, mad circumstances where you're just destined to, to you know, in the end, you're going you're gonna. to. And I remember it had been really, really windy that night, blowing right into me. And I had a massive rowing boat, all right? And it was massive. It made a metal aluminium. And it was like... And I went out, I put three rods out, and um, during the night I got breamed on all three. And the bloke that was fishing behind me on sheep walk come round and he said, what are you doing? I'm going back out there. I'm putting them baits out one by one. And I did. And he just looked like you were mental. And I thought, no, this is this is a great wind. I know roughly where I'm going. And in them days, there was a, like a, a bar out of the water. It's been 
it's been levelled off since then, but and there was a swing on it. So I, I, but I just seeing where that was in the moonlight, I knew roughly where I could do it, and it was windy. It was windy. So I just literally went out there and I literally hoofed it all over the side, a whole bucket over the side, a bank over the side, everything. Back to the bank. In the morning, another two bream, I think it was, whatever. And the last rod was out there, and I'd put the landing net up to dry because I'd landed the bream. I put the landing net up behind me, quite a long way. And it's um, I've had this bite, so I'm playing this fish. It's cruised down in front of me, just felt like a big weight. And as it's cruised, I've just seen the ripple of all the scales along the linear line just rippling like that. Oh my god! So I went down to put the landing net. Up. Oh my god! It's here, <laughs> and I'm going back like letting line off to get the landing net. You know, the fish of your dreams. And um, <laughs> yeah, and I, I got got it in there and I netted it. And it was like forty forty one pound, whatever. But it was it was her, you know, and another one that's long gone since then. But she became a dream for a lot of people. Yeah, you know, a lot of people wanted to catch that carp. She was a special one. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. one that really, really, really got you going. But uh, and that, that was an end of an era for me. I'd grown up on the Ellis Lake to a certain degree. Mm. Nineteen eighty eight, when I went and joined my mate Jacko, who was fishing over there, and we used to go down and just have big socials down there and whatever. So and you know, them fish had grown to that size while we were on there. But I'd never caught her, never caught her. So um, it was mad. And funny enough, the other big one in there, I caught that when it was seventeen pound, and it fought for forty five minutes one winter night. I couldn't get out my sleeping bag and it beat me up and I, I always called it the bastard fish. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to bastard fish. Well, well, it would be, wouldn't it, if you had it for that long. That's right. Go 17 on, pounder as well, like, you know, but in, 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 again, really, that, that, that's fishing though, isn't it? When you're mm. playing them, it doesn't matter what size they are, sometimes if they fight, you, you know, your, your, your art's going 10 to a dozen. Oh, well, we've had some bizarre ones where you're playing a fish in the middle of the night and you, you, you're expecting something completely different to be in the net when you've landed it. Yeah. And it's just, it's... Yeah. What about Welly then? Because how did you end up fishing Welly? Well, Welly was... Um, <clears throat> it was a really easy water. Um, it had a lot, a lot of 20s in there. I think the year I fished it was about 2002. And that... Um, that year, I forget where I was that year. Anyway, so uh, two or three of my mates were fishing it on a syndicate, and a lot of the old Yateley lot who were local mm. to Yateley in the 80s, they were all on there. And they were all family men, lot of them didn't do a lot of time and what have you. And they said, um, you know, do you want a ticket? So, because um, a bloke I know had caught one of them, and had, I'd been around his house to congratulate him. He said, oh, you'll never get a ticket. And I remember, and I went around there to congratulate him. So I was a little bit peeved. So it just so happened that I told this story to one of the lads who had a ticket for it, and he said, Mick, would you like a ticket? <laughs> I'd never seen the water, and it was £575, which was a huge amount of money in 2002. And I thought, oh, do you know what? Just to show him, I think I would. So I got the ticket. But you weren't particularly excited about the stock? Or I didn't really know the stock, really. I, I, no, I, 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 I didn't really know that much about it. I just thought to myself, I'll go there, do a bit in the winter, because if there's a lot of fish in there, it's got to be good for the winter. And it was. It was a good winter water. Um, but that year I went on there, there was like nine thirties in there. There was no 40s in there. And one of them grew to 40 pound in the two years I was over there. But again, I was still fishing Nutty Lane for them two years and I was still fishing Pit 4 up in the Calm Valley as well. So I didn't fish it all the time. But in the winter I did. In the winter I loved it. I was the only one there. But you know, you, you sometimes you think, why did I do this? I went round in the winter and I thought, furthest swim from the car park, no one's going to go round there in the winter. I'll bait it up. <laughs> so I started baiting it. I would, I would journey down once during the week and then I'd fish it one night and I'd bait it on the night I fished it. And um, I'd, I'd done loads. And... No one fished it all winter. Next to nobody, hardly anybody fished it all winter. So I had that swim anyway. I could have made it a lot easier and had it near the car park somewhere. But um, th it was just a love, again, a lovely, when that park shut, it was a lovely place to be. You know, it was a huge amount of fish in it. It wasn't hard fishing, but you know what? I really enjoyed fishing with some of my old mates. And Was and there a lot of demand for a ticket on that? Yeah, yeah, there was, but it was only a 15-man syndicate. Mm. Which, again, that was the joy of the place. Again, a lot of people don't see that. You know, that, for me, was the fact that 15-man syndicate, it was beautiful mm. at the time. Um, and, then, and again, you, you weren't really going there to catch massive fish. They grew to that size, and eventually I did. I caught the first 40 pounder I ever caught. You that. did, yeah. Yeah, so, which was, you know, but I loved it down there. Which one have I, we got up here now? That's, that is one of my first fish out there. That's, one of, that's a long gone, that one. That mm. was a 34 pounder. 
But um, that's the one when I caught it. Uh, I was so excited. I ran up to King, who was fishing elsewhere on the lake, and there was all the public around, and I literally jumped head over heels and done a roly-poly and stood up like that. <laughs> and everyone was just looking like I was soaking wet. <laughs> but, yeah, that was, um, again, just it was a lovely place, and it was fishing in a happy environment, you know? Could you, could you sort of foresee what that lake was going to do in the years after that? On the second year, we all started using the sail. I think it was a Yateley Angling boilie we all started using. And um, I thought, what was it called? I forget what it was called now. Anyway, we all started using it and putting it in, and you could literally see the fish getting bigger. So I knew they were going to do well, and it went from, when I first went on there having 9.30s, it probably went to 30, 35, 30s in there, and A40 when I left uh, two years later. Um, so you knew they were getting big, and there was a lot coming through, and I just thought it's going to go. And then I saw all the anglers that were trying to get on there, and they were going to increase the list, and they were going to do this, and I thought it's time to go. My mate Woody stayed, and he said he wished he hadn't. Um, but I, I, um, I, I knew, I just knew. No, no, no bad blokes or anything like that, just the fact that I just knew that it would be publicised big time, you know, and it was just going to come a media water, which it did. Were those fish on the way up before the the bait started going in? Yeah, but, or did yeah, the bait yeah, make yeah, a difference? Yeah, but, but then no, they 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 weren't on their way up like that. Right, the, the, using boilies in huge amounts, mm. like, not huge amounts when we were on there, but subsequently, the more that people they they got big. Mm. You know, it was it was astronomical, really, and and you know, to, it gets a lot of criticism. I wouldn't have gone there in future years. You know, the fish were looking a bit tired and what have you, but it made a lot of people's dreams, and they loved it. You know, good luck to them. I still think it's a lovely place to fish. Yeah. I'd love to fish there, actually. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I mean, you're on a country park, and yeah. they like, they seem to run a nice syndicate on there. Everyone yeah, seems I, to get on pretty again, much. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, well, what's not to like? No, exactly. You know, I mean, yeah, the fish the fish were Sammy. There's no doubt about that. They yeah. Were, they were a certain strain that looked very Sammy, but but they were they had condition at the time. I think as they got older, they, they started losing that condition. They were a bit pale as well and what have you, and it just sort of went. And then they started blue dyeing the water and mm. all that sort of stuff, and it, it changes somewhere. But luckily, I didn't have to see that. I saw it at what I could. It wasn't its best in size-wise, but it was the best of times, you know, with your friends. And to see Kingy again and Dickie, who I fished on Yately with in them 80s, was just magnificent. And one time, we even done a slideshow, and we set up a great big marquee and had a generator, and we'd done a slideshow and we just were just at you know there was 15 members we were just bladdered just doing there rambling about anything it was fantastic you yeah. know and i met friends on the caravan park as well a guy called dave and ja uh, dave and jackie his mate essex dave funnily enough lives on canvey island and um yeah i met them there and they're still lifelong friends you yeah. know I've been friends ever since you know and i've stayed with them they've stayed with us and i went and visited welly with them they they pulled a caravan on there and we went for a wonder and there was a bloke there, and he said to, he, he recognised me, and he said, "Are you ever going to come back here, Mick?" And I said, "Nah, it's not my cup of tea no more." You know, stupidly, really, I shouldn't have said it, but I did. And he said to me, "The thing is, Mick," he said, "You know, I only fish ten days a year, so he said I know it's a lot of money, and it's costing me a hundred pound a time. This is when it was probably a thousand pound." He said, "But I've got a chance of a forty pounder, and I live up north." And I sat there, and from that moment onwards. I never ever said anything bad about Welly. Mm. I just think to myself, like, you know, good luck to you. You know, good luck to you. Who am I to tell him not to go and do that? Yeah, you know, no, it might not be anyone else's cup of tea. It might not be my cup of tea now or whatever. But it, w w all I can say is when I went on there, that friendship thing again from years and years ago was just overwhelming. And some yeah. of those Yately guys are still fishing on there now, aren't they? Yep. So there's still... Exactly. A, guy, a friend of ours... Um, he said to me, because um, you wouldn't necessarily expect him to be fishing on there, but he said, when you hook one in there, chap, when you hook one, it feels like the earth's moving. I think I know who he is when he says the word chap. <laughs> feels like the earth's moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do, yeah. You know, there yeah. is that, you know, I, I think it's a, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now you're fishing on the Dinton, which in some respects, I mean, it's a bit of a circuit water. Yeah. You. Yeah. Uh, so are you, I mean, are you a little bit surprised at yourself for sort of, you know, fishing um, on somewhere like that? I, I was, I was. It's, a, again, a, a little story, really, with Terry Peff. You know, he, he said to me, you've got to come down. He'd fished it on days for a few years, and they were nice. I knew they were nice fish. And I knew Simon and a couple of other people and what have you. And uh, I sort of, I'd just been elsewhere, and I'd, I'd, you know, obviously been to the Cotswolds, and I fished there, and whatever, and, and another place, and I was just at a, a, a crossroads, and I had another choice to go somewhere else, and I thought I might give it a go. I remember Pierce, my mate, saying to me, <laughs> just, like, he, he more or less snorted in my face, like laughing, because it was White Swan I was going to fish, 
and no one thought I'd even last two weeks <laughs> out of my friends and because it's just too busy um very competitive um and there's a f- bloody lot of good anglers I mean you know young anglers that are top of their game and um they're better anglers basically um they don't have as much fun I don't think but they are better and I've learned a hell of a lot up there you know and also being in amongst some of them also you know you up your game a little bit what have you learned on there then you've been at it a long time Mickey well there was a uh, uh, Zig Riggs came into it mm. Zig Riggs came into it and um, I hadn't I'd, obviously we used to use suspended baits and they, would, they mm. were like an old Zig Rig in the 80s but I hadn't used anything like that for a long long time and um, a couple of fish had been caught on them and one guy on there who funny enough is uh, sponsored by you guys and um, little Lukey, he caught one, and I went and netted it for him and what have you. And he was like, oh, God, keep it, God, keep it, keep it quiet. So anyway, I'll give it two weeks, and I thought, I didn't want to just jump on and start using it, but unbeknown to him, someone had already caught one a couple of weeks before, but, you know, he, as far as he knew, he was the first one to catch it out there on it. And uh, literally, I, um, I went in the shop, and I bought a load of the old colder stuff. Pre-tied ones. Nice you, I think I think it was six, eight, ten. No sponsorship, but uh, <laughs> yeah, six, eight, and ten. Oh, and I paid full whack. <laughs> um, and literally, I um, I, I set one up and I luzzed it out. About ten minutes later, all the, the I think it was there was a couple of lads there, and there was um, Simon Bartlam and a couple of other lads there, all stood in the swim. And all of a sudden, I've just had this belter, this run. Oh my god, I've got a bite. I think it was a ten-foot one at the time. So I'm playing this fish. And I've got it in the lead still swinging up there. It hadn't come off properly and what have you. So anyway, on that, it was a 29 pounder. Beautiful. Like It was like, with all that noise in the swim and everything, and I just luzzed out this bit of foam. It was just incredible. You know, and that really, we, you know, obviously we stuck, we got we got a little bit away with it that year. We, you know, we were allowed to use it a bit and not everyone cottoned on too quickly. But now, obviously, it's, it's normal over there now um, when it's allowed, because obviously it's only allowed certain times of the year. Right. Um... But yeah, and, and that was little Lukey pointed me the way there. Mm. So um, yeah, just just things like that. And then them lads and the others on there, you know, there's a lot of them. They they chop and change different methods all the time. They are they've got their fingers on the ball all the time. But you said you're not a chop and changer so much. You no, I'm not. No, that's thing. right. But sometimes if it's, your face is being rubbed in it, you, you you've mm. got to move with the times, you mm. know. And and, and that, that's how it is up there. You know, these guys catch more than than me all. Oh, yeah, you know, each year some of these young they're good, you know. I, you know, I'll, I'll catch my fair share, but them guys they they double, sometimes even treble what you're mm. catching, and it is because they've got their fingers on the pulse. And I, I love learning, mm. you know. And um, like I, I hear a lot of people say things like sheeping up and copying and whatever, but it just makes me smile, you know. Everybody's learnt from someone at some stage, and the, the day you stop learning is the is the day I'll probably give give up the hobby. What you say in this book as well, don't you? We said yep. last week about the chod rig, and you yep. were like you, you oh. weren't afraid to. Get on the phone and ask. Oh, sorry. <laughs> honestly, honestly, tw- two occasions I had that. I had it once over Frencham, and um, they were, sorry, uh, Golden Mile. <laughs> Golden Mile. And um, it's too late, they're all dead now anyway. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, <laughs> literally, I um, I was over there, I kept showing, and I had about three or four week period, I couldn't get a bite, and I'd been catching, so I couldn't work it out. And um, I thought, one of them chods will work, heavy seal, it's going to lay on the top. Thought, yeah, that, that could work or whatever. So I remember ringing up Martin King and Steve Fantuzzi, who was thinking anglers with Ben at the time, and they they, they told me like, how to tie it up, but I had none and what have you. But anyway, I managed to nick a 33-pounder out of there on it, so I had a little bit of experience with it. But then I was up in the Cotswolds on the lake that I met you, and um, literally they were showing on me, and it, it was in the winter, and I was thinking, I ain't getting bites here. Oh, the presentation, it's all low weed, and I thought, yeah, that's that one everyone's been using for mm. five or six years, and... Shelley and uh, Nigel and um, Terry had all. They said didn't it. hide it, did they? They didn't hide it. It was the you know, but but again, that old. Oh, I ain't using that. I don't need to. That comes into play. The old dinosaur. So I thought that's the one that'll do it. I'm sure of it. So I literally rung my mate Joe up, and I'd been drawing a dry gram and all the bits, and Kingy was going to send them to my house and what have you. And I rang my mate Joe up, who lives in Bristol Way, and I said, "You couldn't do me a favour. You couldn't." get me a packet of pre-tied chods, pre-tied chods that um, ESP do. And he went, <laughs> it went quiet. And he went, you are joking me, Mick, aren't you? And I went, 
no, 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 I'm serious, mate. I said, I'm serious. And he went, you want me to drive all the way? I said, yeah, get a carry on the way through. <laughs> so he did. And he brought them down, got them, lost them out. I had a couple of tents uh, the next afternoon, and the weather was just warm. It just got, the winter, winter was savage. I'd had six, six weeks of frost all the time. And the, the temperature had just gone up that day, and I thought, and I caught a couple of tents, and I thought, this is the night. This is the night. I just knew. But I knew I needed one out there. So I put one of them chods on, and a big old pop up, and I just lost it as far as I could. I think it was about 100 yards, which is a long way for me. So it's gone out there, put all three rods out, whatever. And in the middle of the night, it's just gone. I'm playing it all by myself. Big thump, and I knew, I knew it was a good one. And it was the, tw uh, was it the twin? It was the twin. Was it, yeah. Oh, yeah. My, oh my Lord. On a chod, on a pre-tied chod. Oh, the shame of it. And I told, no shame in I told him Terry Fairfield, he laughed, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and it's been a good good thing. I, I, I'm not ashamed of it. I thought it was brilliant. And then obviously... That was a perfect presentation on that lake. perfect. My, yeah. my friend was doing something quite yep. similar on there yep. with that low-lying weed. Yep. That, that's, that's the one it on is, It was definitely the one. And I mean, the garden, Same area of the lake where you were The Garda brothers were the ones who really, really were doing mm. it on there when I was on there, especially Dan. Mm. You know, he'd had that look and length, or mm. long and length, he'd had that one. And I think it was 39 at the time. But that was a great lake to do that on, you know, really, really good. But the the, the, the piss taking I had after that was unbelievable. And then it all happened again with the pre-tied chods, uh, the pre-tied um, zigwigs. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, a bloke called Paul Eaton over on Dint, and he, he said it to me, you know, oh, oh, pre-tied, pre you know, they, they found it hilarious. But again, I, I had nothing with me. I didn't know how to tie it up. I had no idea. So I know this is, this is going to make you really wrong. I ended up watching videos, and uh, not videos, on the uh, YouTube of your mate Tom Duff, <laughs> Ali Bloody Amidi, and someone else, right? And I'm watching them, and they go, and all, they're all, they're all, all, all. Ricky Gray. And I'm sitting there, like, looking, and I thought, if only they knew, if only they knew, I'm sat there, and I did. But do you know why? Because I didn't want to stick something out there that was wrong. And that first one I caught, literally, the lead didn't come off. So, and it was then that I, I read more into it and I realised you had to put it on very loosely, et cetera, et cetera, try, you know, trying to get it come off on the take, basically, and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was again, a learning curve, and I'm, I'm not ashamed to admit that whatsoever. Put your yeah. ego to one side, Mick, isn't it? Exactly, yeah, but don't ever ask me to tell you anything, because I won't. <laughs> 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 I, actually, I was I, hoping to ask you something. I actually haven't got anything really to show anyone rig wise. So I do. Yeah, there's been a couple of things over the years that we've used um, that have been definitely been good. And that little period, 2009, that was a good little period for me. And what well, um, did you think? You're kind of what a straightforward but efficient angler. Then I, I, I don't think I'm even that. I think um, where I see the the guys on, especially whites, when I see them, that they're hundred percent all the time. They are on it all the time, day and night. They, they, God forbid it. They walk around at night listening for fish. <laughs> Why would you do that? They walk past my bivvy and they always laugh because they can hear me snoring. <laughs> you know, but I'm not going to change that because I can't sleep during the day. I have to sleep at night or I don't get no sleep. So you know, it's I. My my thing is I'm probably fishing. At, you know, if if I try to learn and and fish as hard and efficiently as they do, I, I you know I could probably raise my game by forty percent. But I physically and mentally can't. I. I get lazy, mm. you know. I sometimes, especially now I've got the three nights. Sometimes I, I don't, you know. I, I, yesterday, I was over. This time yesterday, I was over Denton. Feet up like that. Load of young girls on the far side, all in their undies, all getting undressed That's what and swimming. All about. Yeah. Luckily, I didn't have my binoculars. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then the next group came and done the same thing. I mean, what's a man supposed to do? Move? No chance. <laughs> there weren't any fish near me f for that day. I knew I should have moved, but I didn't do it. And I just but thought you I'm were in paradise. Yeah, and I was coming here to today, and I just thought, you know, there's always another day, and, that, and that's that's the thing. When you see the other anglers, like they are, they are. You know, it's it's taught me a lot in the aspect of how they apply themselves you know it's it's too intense I, I don't like it that intense and i don't like seeing you know a few arguments along the way you know a bit of casting in people's swims and what have you but that is a busy circuit water but it is much credit to simon bartlam it is it is you know they've, they've got some lovely 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 fishing and but it comes at a cost on there and that is how busy it is you know, and how intense it is, but it's, it's a real But you're going to stay there until you, you catch these... Uh... Well, I think, um, I was talking to one of the other lads on there about the other day, you you, you spend a bit of time criticising it and, and, and slagging it off to a certain degree, but you're still there three years later. It can't all be bad. <laughs> no. And I must admit, some of, them, some of them fish are just, you know, just off the Richter scale. 
I've you gone know, for this one on abs- the screen. Absolutely off the Richter scale. Yeah. Oh, I forgot this, we had that. Yeah, yeah, yeah look, at the, no. look at the... So even I'm this, buzzing about this one. Oh, no, look how dark no. it is. That's a great... No. Great color. That right that, that that year it got it got caught twice that year. Well, that one too. You know, it's always it's always been a nice looking fish. It's normally a bit more orangey than that, but I don't know that that day that that is unedited. Yeah, it's totally and utterly That's unedited. A there's mad no red color. That fish, there's no red it? hands there, like where they've turned all the contrast and done all that. Yeah. That was bad. If You're you, just like holding it, looking like Whoa. it's just madness. Yeah. Look at that. If you if you pull it up like that, you can see the scales. All right, there you can't even see the scales. That that is a whole linear the whole way down, and a load is of it? scales underneath it, and you can't even see them. Luckily, I've got pictures of it when I put it back in the water in the sun, so you can see all that. But again, the thing, let's see, it's one of the guys on there, Luke. Again, he done some pictures for me. They were world class. Him and um, Gaz Farron, funny enough. But um, literally, Luke's were world class and Gaz's were. But Luke, he was so excited when the, when the, I pulled that net that sack out like that he come over and he's not a touchy touchy type person he literally come over and i've got a little video of it somewhere and he come over and he, he ruffled my hair like that as soon as he saw it he went oh my god <laughs> oh and he, he you know and that's what it's about and i know yeah. he, he, he you know i know he wants to he, and he's caught he's caught some lovely other ones out there but i know he wants that one you know he would love as ever, as most of us that, would that is an amazing yeah that's an amazing yeah. Yeah. Mate, that and again awesome. you know you sit there and the other day i was over on on the other one on black and hmm. this guy over there that i've known the last three weeks and got quite friendly with strongbow pete and uh, for obvious reasons <laughs> um he, he had one of the monsters you know it was absolutely massive and about I don't know how long. You know, people say about four foot long car. He said you need to take a tape measure with you. Well, I've I've sent I've said to Terry Peff, my mate, I said that if if I catch it, I'm only going to send him a message, and it's just going to say bring the tape measure <laughs> because that's how long it is. I, I I you know I don't know whether this one is genuinely going to be a, a 42 inch uh, a 46. I think inch. you struggle with that one. You need to get it flat first of all, which is not easy, no, is it? No, it's like bendy no, and yeah. No, but again, what what a carp, you know and. That's what's keeping me there, yeah. without a doubt. And you know, there's a lot of nice guys on there as well, like yeah. you know, and uh, yeah, you know, Simon and Tell. Tell hopefully when Tell goes off and catches this last of the leanies that he's after, then um, he'll come back over and my old buddy will be fishing with me, and we can uh, and we can just sit over there t- till our dying days. Hopefully. Yeah, hope I hope so. I hope so. But yeah. you know, I mean, you sort of think to yourself that the uh, that you know you finished certain species and especially the leanies. And just one more towel, literally a few years later, after finishing the leany thing, one of the fish I'd, I'd seen a few years before, um, long story short, my mate got the fishing rights to it. So I didn't have to poach it, and which I probably wouldn't have done anyway. And eventually I went there, and you know, I've caught, I caught this, this fish in the winter, on January the, uh, January the 7th, and it was a 40 pound leany, you know, and... I've looked for Leany since. <clears throat> there's a couple of walkers with me and I can't get a ticket. Um, and there's probably other secret ones about that I don't know about. You know, there's a lot of Leany's that are claimed to be Leany's that ain't. So mm. it's probably done, mm. you know, probably done. But, you know, my mate Tell's sitting there. He's caught one of them, which is a beauty. And he just wants the other one there. He wants the bigger one there. And he's just fixated. The same as I was. The same as the bloke who bought the lake was. You know, and it's, I just wish there was more of them fish. I know there is leanies being bred. I know people. But I was going to say, like, original leanies. <coughs> How old do you think the youngest uh, <coughs> original leany is now? Well, that's, that, that, that's, that's the question. That would be, well, the, the, the French and ones when I was fishing, were, well, I think were 59 years old. So I think they went on a little bit longer, 63, uh, uh, you know. So they're, they're the odd one dotted around from that stocking, they may well be. You know, they may well be sort of like 65, 66 years old now. Mm. There was others stocked a bit later, you know, up to 64, 65. Mm. So there's probably a few, a handful of them around. But in general now, it's going to be second and third generation leanies if you can find them, you know. But I just wish people were stocking them. But the thing is, they they haven't really grown so quick, you know. So literally, people wanted faster growing strains. Is it the look of them or the vintage sort of quality of them, though, for you? With us, it was the old age of yeah. them as well as, the, as well as the looks. But obviously, in the future, it needs to be for the looks. Mm. And they're genuinely, in the main, they're not all slimmer and longer, but they're genuinely quite long carp, thin wrists, overslung mouth, hoover head, and quite scaly. Not all, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a cracking strain. And mm. they lived a long time. But again, whether that's 
whether that's us lot, you know, fishing for them now more intensely that's making them not live quite as long, I don't know. Or whether it's just the strain. I think it's the strains. Yeah, do you not think when you keep going down bloodlines, it's not, it's just not. That's what they say, yeah. Yeah. And and again, that's where that argument's come in about bringing other bloodlines in from other countries and that, you know, which has muddied the water. But as my mate Phil said, Phil Tomo said many years ago, he said, Mick, he said, in 25, 30 years, you won't even know what country fish you're fishing for over here. You won't even know. No. And to a certain degree, that's come about, you know. He he, he foresaw that a long time ago, and it, it has got a little bit like that. Mm. But I've still got enough that, that satisfy what I want. So, you know, hopefully for the next 20, 25 years, mate, I can carry on having a little go. It, look, it just sounds like you're still enjoying it and, uh, you know, and uh, you've got enough to sort of occupy yourself. Oh, yeah. Last question, are Chelsea going to win the league anytime soon? Don't do be think? silly. I don't think they're going to win the league, no. But I think they're building a team that's going to win it eventually. No, they've signed some brilliant they players. Have, they have, yeah. yeah. Very young players, yeah. So, But I've seen them win the league. You know, or buy the league, as some say. <laughs> I, I was actually, I was, and again, you, you talk, we talk about fishing, having different kinds of people in. Um, literally, um, football's very, very similar because <laughs> when we won the league for the first time in my lifetime, which was the second time ever, which was 2005, Mourinho, literally, we couldn't go because it was away to Bolton and we couldn't get tickets because there was only 3,000 tickets available to Chelsea fans. So I thought, what are we going to do anyway? My mate, Paul Murrell, he Muzza, he won a poker game and he won thirty grand. He bought one hundred tickets at one hundred and thirty pound <laughs> each. All right, all in a line, and they were VIP tickets. So you had to go and have food first and have a comedian on and then go in. <laughs> now, when we got there, we were all suited and booted, white shirts. We had such a mixture of people. We had criminals, <laughs> we had scientists, carpenters. Accountants, carp hangers, post, we had everything. And anyway, literally, we went in there and they said, um, We know you're Chelsea fans, but listen, you know, we know you like singing songs, you're not allowed to sing. Of course, within 10 minutes, we're on the chairs. <laughs> 10 men went to mow. All the Bolton dignitaries, they loved it, they were brilliant. It was all good humoured. And they had a comedian, and he was on anyway. All of a sudden, my mate stood up, he's gone, Oi. Get off. She said, get off. I'm getting, he got up there, started telling the jokes. <laughs> Had them all in stitches. And eventually they walked us through to the end. And all you can see, and I've got it on video at home, is a whole row of 30 of us all stood or <laughs> sat in them seats, all with white shirts and black trousers on, all identical, you know, from all walks of life. Brilliant. And I'll never forget standing there looking out when the second goal went in and just sit, standing up and we were singing, have you ever seen Chelsea win the league? Mm. And there ain't many people that did. <laughs> and we did. And it was, it was, again, that like fishing has its magical moments and like family stuff. There's yeah. magical moments in all of them, like, you know, mm. and having a blend of all them things is, is, is the way I've liked to have done it, you know, and, the I've, right balance. Yeah, the right balance, yeah. Long may it continue. Mick, it's been a good show. Lovely, mate. Uh, you were in good form. Yeah, very enjoyed it, Nice mate. and easy, yeah, very wasn't it? Very much enjoyed it, yeah. yeah. Oh, 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 one other thing, like... You've got am another I, gift for us. Am I sweating under there? <laughs> actually, you're not, are you? I'm you've not. Done well. No, I, I think you've done all right, actually. Old Ozzy kept you going for three and a half hours. He was sweating <laughs> like anything. <laughs> Love you, Oz. <laughs> Mick, very, thanks very much for coming on the show. Brilliant. Much appreciated. No, no problem, sir. Best of luck it. at Dinton as well. Okay, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers, mate. The Thinking Tackle Podcast.